Thank you, Matt. Um, and good morning. As I think everybody knows, I'm Alicia McGill. I'm the chair of the, the committee. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here and um, for the incredible work that, that staff does every time. But we have a full slate of um, National Register properties for this meeting. So like, I know everybody's been working really, really hard. Um, and also, for everybody's ongoing flexibility with um, working virtually. Um, maybe by October, we'll be able to see each other in person, which would be lovely. Wow. Um, I, I am gonna discuss just a few structural logistics, um, but I wanna acknowledge that uh, Secretary Wilson is with us and has some um, comments and like welcoming comments. And so I will we'll do, the structural logistics just for the public before um, we have Dr. Uh, uh, Secretary Wilson, um, Wilson's comments, and then we'll go into the rest of the logistics and introductions and reports and, and all of that. So um, for any members of the public, everybody else here, this is being live streamed um, to the public on YouTube and being recorded both audio and uh, video is being recorded. The public will not be able to comment vocally um, or through the audio, but uh, the chat room function on YouTube has been enabled. And so comments can be shared there and then um, they can be shared with all of us through our, our chat room function. Um, what else do I wanna mention? Because, and, and this is because this is a public meeting and not a, a public hearing. As previously, if we have any kind of significant tech issues, I'll assess whether or not we need to take a break, change order of presentations, take an early lunch, anything like that. And I will communicate um, and, and probably staff will as well through the chat room function, but also through email so that people know what, what's going on. Um, and please mute yourselves. Um, during the presentations and discussion, unless you are speaking, um, please use the chat room function to share any kind of resources. Often people will, will share reports and, and links with us, um, pose questions if your audio is, is having any issues, but please avoid any kind of side conversations through the chat room. Um, I think that's all of my like general logistics. So I'm gonna welcome Secretary Reed Wilson um, and, uh, and I'll turn over the floor to you. Thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, greetings from Alamance Battleground State Historic Site where I happen to be this morning for a site visit. Uh, and later today, I'll be at Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in Winston-Salem. So I'm pretty sure I have the best job in state government. But anyway, uh, it is great to be with you and to see you uh, on the screen. And I look forward, uh, as Alicia said, to all of us meeting in person in the future. Uh, more and more of that is happening and it is a wonderful thing when people can actually get together uh, and shake hands and hug and, and conduct business. So we will get there. Um, I know you all are at least somewhat familiar with our department, but just want to do a quick recap of what we do. I like to think of us as the department of all the things people love about North Carolina, whether it's our rich history, our diverse, diverse arts and culture, our scientific assets, our spectacular natural areas. I mean, you know, we get to take care of all these places, and I think we feel lucky every day to be able to do that. And you know, we take care of North Carolina treasures literally from A to Z, um, to art museums, arts council, aquariums, archives, African American Heritage Commission, archeology, span all the way to the zoo, the Z is obvious, um, but we have all these other things in between, you know, our state library, state symphony, 41 parks, seven museums of history, natural science museum, I think 26 historic sites, our land and water stewardship division, and of course, historic preservation. Um, and all of these places and all of these ideas that they represent help make North Carolina such a wonderful place to live. Um, I think they help create a shared identity among all of us and they do literally provide common ground, which is an especially important commodity these days. Um, and I have set five priorities at our department 
they're consistent with Governor Cooper's priorities. Not a big surprise there, but I'll just go through them real quickly because um, you'll see where historic preservation fits into a lot of it. Uh, one is education. That is both the field trips that we anticipate resuming in the fall. We can't wait for that but also the amazing amount of online content we put out on the web for parents, teachers, students in the last year. Um, 1,500 pieces of educational content that were viewed 250 million times, uh, which is just a whole lot. We feel great about that. And we wanna do more uh, to reach students around the state so that they can have a full understanding of this wonderful state they live in. Um, so education was the first. Health protection is the second. I'm not Dr. Mandy Cohen, but uh, through our parks and trails and greenways programs and through our land and water fund and natural heritage program that protect water quality, we do have an important role to play in both physical and mental health. Um, I know during the pandemic, every time I get out on my bike on a greenway or on a trail in a park, I feel better up here uh, and in my body as well when I'm done. And I certainly see uh, the joy that people have on the trails. Um, third is diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And this covers several things. One is who we are. Um, I think we need to do a better job of reaching out to diverse communities so that when we have job openings, more diverse people apply. We're still gonna hire whoever's the best person, but as long as we have a, a large diverse pool, we're more likely to look like North Carolina more than we currently do in the future. Um, it also means telling a really broad array of stories of North Carolina people and organizations and communities. So for the next three and a half years, we're going to continue to expand the stories and the history that we tell um, so that we do reflect our very diverse culture, both from thousands of years ago all the way up to today, because this state has changed a lot. And I think we should reflect all of that. And I think we just need to do a better job but making sure we're engaging with communities and listening to what they want from us. So that's one, two, three. Uh, the fourth is economic development. Um, and that's everything from historic preservation um, to the heritage tourism and ecotourism that we um, spur in all those sites we have around the state. Uh, we've also been very involved in broadband expansion through our sites. So there's a lot of ways that we help local communities thrive you know, I think we've seen in lots of small towns that the arts can just take hold and all of a sudden restaurant comes in next door and then a business comes in and, and the town thrives and grows and people want to stay there. And that's all good. And then the last one um, is climate change and resiliency together. Uh, I think our department has an important role to play to uh, educate in a very objective, non-threatening way um, what climate change is, uh, what causes it, what the effects are, and what we can all do about it as individuals, families, communities, businesses, governments to fight climate change and also to make our communities more resilient. And I know that you know planning and historic preservation have a big role to play in resiliency. And so do putting parks and greenways and trails and floodplains so that if those areas do get flooded, it's not a scene of uh, economic and devastation or loss of life, but it's hey, the trail got washed out, let's fix it. And for all the other times when it's not flooding, it's a wonderful community amenity. Anyway, so those are the five. Um, and I do think that historic pres preservation has a huge role to play in those because it is so important in communities across the state. You know, in a lot of places, historic preservation efforts have helped spark the revitalization of a downtown. Uh, bringing back a, a vibrant local economy, which again is so important, especially in our rural areas where a lot of those counties are losing population. Um, obviously, and you all know this better than I do, but historic pr preservation helps you know, create a real sense of place and maintains a, commun a community's character and preserves connections to the past, which is so important. Um, and I think it's obvious that historic preservation is important to lots of people. That's why you all keep getting more and more requests for um, sites or districts being put on the National Register. You know, you had 20 new listings last year in a pandemic year. Um, and it looks to me like you're going to have more than that this year. 
Um, I know you have a crowded agenda, so I'm going to shut up soon um, so you can get to it. But, you know, the fact that this state has over 2,900 listings in the National Register, which includes over 540, which are historic districts, which might include lots of buildings. Obviously, this is a really important element in the life of communities across North Carolina um, as we recognize and preserve our rich history and diverse culture and the architecture and all the things that get wrapped up in historic preservation. Um, so I want to thank each of you for all that you do. I know you have a lot of information to sift through and important decisions to make, and I appreciate the commitment and the passion and the talent and the expertise you bring to this. Uh, this is a highly functioning program and we appreciate what you do. Um, obviously we couldn't do this without you. So for all of you, both on the committee, but also the staff, I just wanna say thank you for a job really well done, especially in this last 15 months where everything has been more difficult because of the pandemic. Um, so again, I know you have a busy agenda. I'm thrilled to be with you. I gotta go do a site tour. And you all have a big, big agenda anyway, but thanks for having me. Thanks again for all that you do and good luck with your meeting. Take care all. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so now I'm gonna go through some logistics during the meeting um, for all of us. This is like similar to how we've been running all of these meetings, but I just wanna remind everybody and also remind or, or let members of the public who are listening in know. Um, we have a you know, conflict of interest policy. So um, please disclose now um, if you have identified any conflicts of interest with any of the properties that we'll be considering today um, so that we can make sure that we have quorum. Um, and then if anybody has to step out for the meeting um, I'll be able to just text you and, and, and have you come back. Are there any conflicts of interest? Um, I believe that I do. This is um, Dr. Jonathan Valerie and Jonathan, the conflict of interest because I am um, on the executive committee for Preservation North Carolina and one of the properties that is owned by ENC is coming up. Is, is that the case that we will have to um, have Dr. Johnson recuse herself from the discussion about the. I, I think that's a valid. Yep. Uh, I, I just, brought up. Yep. I just want to confirm. So, um, okay. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Johnson, if you could, um, if you can individually send me your um, phone number through the chat room, then I sure. can just send you a text. I can also send you an email. If you're not able to individually do that, then I can just send you an email. <laughs> okay, no, um, I, can, I can put that in the chat. Okay, um, great. Sure. Thank you. And then I'll just, um, we'll have you recuse yourself for the discussion of that property. And then um, this is the, the Oak Crest Graves oh, House. Great. Um, that's our headquarters. <laughs> yep. Yes. Um, and and then I'll just uh, we'll we'll take our vote and then have have you come back back in for the conversation. And that should not be a problem as of right now with with our quorum. So and uh, Terry. Well, Oak Crest. I don't know that it's necessarily a conflict of interest, but I did the archaeological work for the um, Plummer Hall House next mm -hmm. door. I don't know that that's enough of a conflict of interest because I wasn't directly involved in this project. Ramona, what do you think? Um, it has to do with the listing. Yeah, the listing of the house did, I think, bring into, uh, there was an archeological component to it. I think Sarah Woodard might be able to address that or Jen Bros a little bit. Um, I, did you work on the, on the graves, on the Oak Crest house part or just on the, Hall. Just on the Plummer Hall property, um, and that was for that move specifically and, and had nothing to do. In fact, I didn't realize the house had been moved until the study list, so. Okay. Um, so I, it, I was going to say, it's not the same house as the Oak Crest house. Correct. So, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm not really sure that that has anything to do with Oak Crest. That's not quite the same as what Dr. Johnson's relationship is with the okay. with this property. Yeah, yeah. Real quick, that um, it is on the same property that was um, 
part of the archaeological um, mm -hmm. uh, study. So uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with this, but um, I do mention that there's uh, been archaeology um, done, study done on, on, on the property. Well, in that, in that case, Chair McGill, if both Ms. Russ and Dr. Johnson recuse themselves, how are we looking for a quorum? Or should we, should perhaps by then we'll have more, more have joined us as far as the. That's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm thinking because of, as of right now, we have eight. So if we lost two, we would be below quorum. But mm -hmm. um, I know that Fred Belladin had planned to join us. And I know that Dr. Brothers will be mm -hmm. joining us after 1030. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think we should be okay. And I guess we can kind of revisit when when we when we get there. Yeah, I, I think if both want to recuse themselves, that would be the best course of yeah. action. Yeah. And um, and then we, we should have a quorum sufficient to cover their their absence for that. OK, um, that agenda item. Yep. That sounds good. Thank you, uh, Terry and Dr. Johnson. Um, uh, and and Terry, do the same thing. Obviously, send me your <laughs> um, phone number. Um, and then uh, as, as everybody has seen, and as we discussed um, the last time, there has been significant further discussion about um, the Zebulon district. So I just wanna remind us, and um, if that district comes up after lunch and people have not had a chance to go through um, all of the um, uh, correspondence, please do so um, before that discussion, because I imagine that we're gonna, we're gonna have a significant discussion there. Um, again. Um, the voting, we will do a, a roll call vote. Um, and um, if there are no, um, uh, and then we, we have to make sure that we um, record any kind of like abstentions and, and things like that. So, but because of the nature of this meeting, we have to do the, the roll call vote. Um, we will plan to vote per set of staff presentations um, rather than per property though, as we have been doing, um, but unless there is, we anticipate significant discussion ab about a particular uh, proposal. Um, lunch. Uh, Alicia, on yes. that note, uh, it seems according to the agenda that we should call a vote um, after Lee County's Sanford Historic District, because then two people were accused themselves for Oak Crest, exactly. have a vote on Oak yeah. Crest and then bring them back. Yeah, yeah, that's right. the other, sorry. I, 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 sorry, I didn't clarify that, but yes, like if anybody has to like recuse themselves, then we will do a vote and then have them come back in and then um, move on from there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, reminding us, Matt. Um, and then we do, as, as, as you all know, we do have a full slate of NR nominations. We have a smaller group of um, study list properties um, for consideration. I anticipate that we'll break for lunch um, around 12, 1230, but we'll kind of see where we are. Um, ideally do not hang up or leave the uh, meeting, but just mute your mics and um, click the video button and turn your video off um, and uh, leave Zoom open. But uh, I will check after lunch to make sure that everybody has rejoined us. Uh, I would like us to take um, at least one short break in the morning and one short break after lunch. Um, and um, we'll all remain online there probably around 1115. If someone, if staff could remind me, Sarah or Jen or someone could remind me in the chat room uh, to do that, that would be great. Um, and those are all my general logistics. Uh, so our next order of business is the minutes. Are there any questions or corrections to uh, the minutes from our, our February meeting? Dr. McGill, I have one um, correction from February, which is that um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Snowden was in attendance. I didn't have her in the list in the, um, in the beginning. Um, and then I have one change for the agenda. So just when you get to agenda approval, I have one thing. That's my next uh, uh, order of business. All right, great, thank you. And, uh, and I have one uh, more or less cosmetic to, uh, note to make uh, on the last page of the minutes. Uh, the third uh, line, uh, the third paragraph from the bottom, 
uh, where it says denied, move to approval staff's recommendation. I would just uh, clarify that and say, uh, Dr. Denard moved approval of staff's recommendations. If you, Thank you. If you see the minutes, you, uh, you'll see the difference. Thank you, Dr. That's Denard. all. Okay. Any other comments, corrections, questions? Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes with those two uh, changes? I'd like to make that motion, Terry Russ. Thank you. Uh, is there is there a second? Second, Matt Jorgensen. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, and uh, do we have to do a roll call vote for the minutes, or can we do a? I believe Phil Fagan, our legal counsel, said any any actions have okay. to be roll call. I'm just I'm just making sure. Okay, then we will <laughs> go move through um, a roll call vote for um, for approving the minutes with the two corrections from the February 2021. Uh, meeting, um, and I will um, I, I will follow my Hollywood squares here. Um, so, uh, Dr. Brian, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Um, I vote yes. Uh, Dr. Denard. I vote yes. Thank you, Mr. Bergstone. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. And is that everybody? Did we lose anybody? Yeah, oh, we lost Dr. Baldwin Deathridge. She she had posted a text yeah, I, in the chat. I saw that, yeah, okay. Okay. And she should be able to, we can have people join by, um, by phone as well, correct? So I'll message her to, to have her try to do that. Okay. I, Dr. McGill, I think you still have quorum though, despite yeah. her yeah, voluntary thank you. absence. Thank you. I'm trying to sort of like get all the numbers in my head. So I appreciate it. Okay. So the minutes are approved. Um, and, and we can note also that um, Dr. Baldwin Deathridge, is, it looks like she's rejoining us, maybe. Um, you may want to try and join us via phone if you can, or turn off your video. There's no issue with people having their video off, right? We can. Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. It's one of those strange things where my internet says it's functioning perfectly and keeps kicking me off. I have okay. no idea what's okay. going on. Okay. Well, we'll just, we'll make a note of it too. We, and even if you have to um, step off, uh, periodically or bumped off, we're still okay for now. So thank you. Okay, um, are there any updates or changes to the current agenda? I know that there is a, a name adjustment. Yes, the, um, the uh, owner for Oakcrest would like to change the name to the Graves Fields House. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation. Okay. Thank you. All right, so that's all sort of our logistics. We're gonna move into um, introductions. So I'm gonna ask all of the members of the um, committee to introduce themselves first, please. Uh, and I will just again go through my screen. And so Dr. Bryan. I'm Mary Lynn Bryan. Uh, I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina and am a volunteer. Um, for public history. Thank you, Dr. Bryan. All right, um, Alicia McGill. I'm a faculty um, in the Department of History at NC State um, and contribute to our public history programs and am now associate professor. So <laughs> I can you. happily announce that. Um, all right, uh, Matt, you are next on my screen. Uh, good morning, my name is Matt Jorgensen. My pronouns are he, him. I'm an archaeologist and I live in Raleigh. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Denard. As you indicated, I'm David Denard. I live in uh, Greenville. I'm a recently retired professor in the history department at East Carolina University. Thank you. Ms. Russ. 
I'm an archaeologist. I'm the cultural resource department manager for Terracon, an engineering firm here in Raleigh. Thank you. Uh, David Bergstone. I'm David Bergstone. I live in Winston-Salem. I'm an historic preservationist. I've worked at Old Salem and other historic sites. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson is next on my screen. <laughs> Hello, um, Valerie Ann Johnson. I serve as Dean of Art Sciences and Humanities at Shaw University. I'm an anthropologist by training and also serve on other um, boards and commissions, including chair of the African American Heritage Commission. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Baldwin Dethridge. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Baldwin Dethridge and I'm an Associate Professor of History at Appalachian State in Boone, North Carolina where I teach public history and historic preservation. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we have Matt Zare here who is our IT support. Matt, I don't know if you wanna um, add anything but I know that you'll be here with us um, throughout the meeting. Uh, to address any kind of technical issues that either we have as a whole with the meeting or um, potentially with uh, individuals. <laughs> Thank you, and we really appreciate it and we much, much need it, so, um, okay. Uh, so would, should I use, sometimes we have staff introduce themselves, sometimes we have them introduce themselves um, when they give their presentations. I like to do it at the beginning so that if there are members of the public who are here now, is that, uh, okay, I was just going to ask Ramona, but I don't see her here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just uh, go through my, my square and have everybody else introduce themselves too. So uh, Julie. Hey everyone, I'm Julie Smith. I'm the National Register Assistant at SHPO. Thank you. Hannah. And I'm Hannah Beckman Black and I'm the Survey and National Register Specialist at the Raleigh office. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Annie. Morning everyone, I'm Annie McDonald. I'm the Preservation Specialist based in Asheville for our 25 county Western region. Thank you. Um, Sarah Kuntz, uh, I know that you and Ramona have reports for us, but and we all know you, but I'm still going to have you introduce yourselves or yourself for the, the public that are listening in. Sure. I'm Sarah Kuntz. Um, I'm the State Archivist of North Carolina, and I'm the Acting Deputy Secretary for the Office of Archives and History. Thank you. Sarah Woodward David. <laughs> Good morning, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Woodard, formerly Sarah David, and making the transition back to the original name. Uh, I am the National Register and Survey Branch Supervisor for the State Historic Preservation Office. Thank you. Beth. I apologize, my computer did not want to unmute for a minute. I'm Beth King, I'm the Architectural Survey Coordinator, and I work out of the Raleigh office of SHPO. Thank you. Audrey Thomas. Hi, I'm Audrey Thomas. I'm the Survey, survey Specialist in the Western Region. Thank you. Claudia Brown, welcome. And I'm Claudia Brown. I retired in late 2018 as supervisor of the Survey and National Register branch. And I've been back since late 2019, I think, uh, primarily helping to review National Register nominations. Thank you. Scott Power. Uh, I'm Scott Power. I'm the regional supervisor in the Eastern office for six more weeks, and then I'm retiring at August 1. So I will be out. But I've enjoyed working with everybody. Good to see everybody this morning. Congratulations. We'll miss you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John Wood. Morning, everybody. I'm John Wood. I'm the Restoration Preservation Specialist based in the Shippo Eastern Office in Greenville. Thank you. Jen. Good 
morning, everyone. I'm Jen Bros. I'm the National Register Coordinator for SHIPCO based out of the Raleigh office. Great, thank you. And Ramona. Morning, everyone. I'm Ramona Bartos. I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer and Administrator of the Preservation Office. Good to see you all this morning. Thank you. Um, and I want to acknowledge that uh, Terry Russ and Kristen Baldwin Dethridge, um, this is your last meeting with us before you rotate off. Uh, and so uh, we will also miss you as well. So, but I wanted to just bring that to everyone's attention. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move on to our reports from Sarah Kuntz and Ramona Bartos. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Sarah Kuntz, and I thought I would just give a very brief report about some things going on with the Office of Archives and History um, on the larger level, and I'll let Ramona talk more specifically about, about her division and reports and highlights that she has from there. Um, I do want to uh, thank all of you for your service. I know this is a challenging time to do meetings in Zoom and play Hollywood Squares, and I appreciate um, all your, your work. And I think I would be remiss if I did not also uh, thank the staff for all their hard work. It cannot be said enough that these have been extraordinary times. And I think your full agenda reflects all of their hard work in the time of the pandemic and their creativity in transitioning their work to work off site. And now um, we're looking at how we can safely return to the office and get back to some of that field work and some in-person meetings. So they, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And I know they're up to the challenge because they have just done a outstanding job um, over the last year plus of, of this pandemic time. And um, congratulations to Scott on your future retirement. Um, I hope that's enjoyable for you. Um, just a few things from Office of Archives and History. As I mentioned, we're now looking at the um, how to safely stage our return to work. So that will be occupying some of our time, I'm sure. Um, it's also budget season is kicking up. Um, for those of you that have been following the news, there was a little bit of silence for a while, but now it appears that the House and the Senate are going to be moving more quickly on their budget. Um, we are very optimistic that governor's budget was very good to the Office of Archives and History, and we hope that carries forward into the House and Senate discussions. Some highlights from there include um, some recurring money for the Queen Anne's Revenge um, project and, and restoration. So that was very heartening to see that as a recurring line item. Um, we have some non-recurring money that was put in the governor's request for the upcoming America 250th uh, celebrations. And I'll go over that in a minute. Um, I was pleased that there was money, recurring money for the highway marker program to beef that up. We have some great needs in that area. And so we hope to have some more support there um, as well as some recurring and non-recurring money for the NC anchor um, resource, which is our online history um, resource. Uh, for the department. So we're excited to, to feel like we can maybe continue to expand um, the resources in, in that. Um, there was also in the governor's budget, I'm sure you're all aware, um, a request to extend the sunset of the Article 3H mill tax credits. So that appears to be um, something that is agreeable um, to all sides. So we hope to see that move as well. Um, in our historic sites area, we've really been hitting the message lately about the importance of resources for the upkeep of our properties in our portfolio. They have some great maintenance needs, and the governor's office listened to that and, and put in a request for some recurring money and positions for maintenance that's long overdue in our sites, um, as well as some money for resiliency on their sites, those that have been facing some challenges from climate change and and the effects of natural disasters and, and things like that. Um, he also requested an African-American history curator for historic sites, which would be a, a much needed add for, um, for our agency. And then across the Office of Archives and History, um, there were uh, points of cap, cash capital project and bond capital projects that um, were, were optimistic will go forward as well. Um, and, and those would be some of them around the America 250th and some of them just around some, some basic needs from our, from our sites, um, as well as the Graveyard of the Atlantic and the Museum of History. So that, that was good. We're, we're watching that and, and more to come. So we're, we're hopeful with all those things. Um, the General Assembly has also been reviewing some things that could impact um, the Office of Archives and History, including um, a bill to study the feasibility of a Western History Museum, which has been talked about for many, many years. So that would be another important piece if that goes forward. 
um, as well as a bill to implement the textile study that the Historical Commission reviewed and approved um, a couple of years ago. So we're watching that one as well. And then the only other thing I wanted to highlight, because I know you have a full agenda, as everyone's been saying, is we are really gearing up for the America 250th um, period in, in North Carolina and connecting with the National Commission and connecting across the state. And our department is leading the statewide committee um, with outside partners to start talking about what we would do programmatically. And when I say programmatically, it's not just events on sites. We'll certainly have that. Um, but we want to have a robust portfolio of online resources, curriculum materials for students, and um, just a variety of things. We would really like this to be a statewide effort. We really would like it to reach all 100 counties. And in keeping with um, some of the remarks that um, Secretary Wilson made, we're also really looking to make sure that our stories are expansive and, and, and very inclusive with the 250th. Um, and so with that in mind, um, we have just finished up kind of sketching out our, our three major themes for our programmatic areas. And I thought I'd share those with you. We, we think that they really um, capture the um, desire to have programming around the, the places and spaces and events from the Revolutionary War time period, as well as bring us into more modern history and celebrate and um, do more with uh, the stories from North Carolina of people that were helping us live into the ideals of the revolution and thinking about expanding our rights as citizens um, and things like that. So um, our three main thematic points are gonna be visions of freedom, a gathering of voices and common ground. And for visions of freedom, our thematic statement that we developed around that is, the American Revolution was the beginning of a journey for North Carolinians to seek true freedom. For gathering of voices, we have stated that North Carolina's many voices inspire generations to create and lead. And for common ground, we say places carry our stories of struggle, creation, and connection to one another. So we're very hopeful that those broad thematic statements will take us through all of the areas of DNCR, our parks, our sites, the archives, the history museum, um, the built environment as well as across our, our time span. So not, not just restricted to you know, the 1700s. Um, we can bring it into more modern time periods and really connect people with the revolutionary spirit and what does that mean um, for us as um, North Carolinians and as a nation. So um, look for a lot more on that to come. And if you have suggestions of groups that we should partner with or that might be interested even on a local level, please connect them with us. We are, we're really looking to be very expansive with our partnerships in, in this um, commemorative period. So, and I'm happy to answer any questions if, if there's a minute for that. Are there any questions? I have a question um, and maybe it's because of the influence of Nuber in North Carolina, but um, as one of, a, one of the major places around this revolutionary period. Um, are there special things that are going to happen with at Newburn or or surrounding Newburn because of its um, importance in that in the story? Yes, I'm. I'm sure there will be. We're we're leaving the individual divisions to start sketching out their specific programs, but I can tell you that. One of the things we've been talking about um, early on, we've just applied for an NEH grant um, as part of the American Rescue Plan funds. And that's a one-year grant, no match. That's my favorite kind of grant when there's no match. Um, and so one of the things we're talking about doing is getting a jump start on some of these resources we want. And one of those stories we're wanting to feature is of the Harlow Patriots, um, of the African-American uh, men that that volunteered to fight from that area. And so we're we're conceiving of not just curriculum materials, but also maybe hiring some um, actors to do videos to um, reenact that, to, to, to provide um, folks with another um, avenue to access that story besides just uh, maybe a online you know, article or something. So we're trying to be kind of creative about resources that we're creating as well, so. Cool, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All right. Then we will move on to um, our report from Ramona Bartos. 
Thank you, Dr. McGill. I'd like to echo Sarah's kind comments about our staff and also the hard work of both the committee members and our staff working uh, in partnership. All of you dedicate a lot of time uh, to read over all the materials that the advocates uh, at the local level have uh, put together for these properties, uh, as well as uh, interacting with our staff to uh, make sure that everything is just so-so um, as far as you know the materials that, that are, are before you. So I want to thank you for that. And I particularly want to thank uh, Terry Russ and Kristen Baldwin Dethridge for their, their service. They are rotating off because they have have had three terms and that is the, the term limits. So uh, we will be sending you a book. Uh, we would normally give you that in person, of course, but to thank you for your service to your fellow North Carolinians and we're, we're very appreciative. Um, our staff, we are very anxious to get back all in the office uh, simultaneously together, but I think it is testament to uh, our dedication to our work that we have managed to do all that we've done and more uh, during this virtual time that we've been experiencing. Um, Scott went ahead and, and disclosed what I was going to disclose, which is he is going to be uh, wrapping up nearly 30 years of state service come August 1st, and um, he's gonna have big shoes to fill in Scott's position. He's been our, not only an architectural historian in our office, but also supervisor for the Eastern office based in Greenville. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's too many people whose enthusiasm for architectural history in Eastern North Carolina and the places and the people that are represented by those, uh, those historic properties. I, I don't think there's too many people in North Carolina who can match Scott's enthusiasm and expertise uh, to be able to understand those places and help others do the same. So Scott, Enfield's gonna be your swan song. That's a good one to go out on as well. So uh, would you like to say anything, Scott, before, before I give the rest of the report? No, not really. Just again to echo that I really enjoyed working with um, the staff and everyone on this committee and all the other committees. And, and I was talking to John this morning. I'm not sure, but I think I haven't missed a single NRAC in 30 years. I think that's right. So wow. send me a little send me a little gold star. <laughs> but thanks to everyone. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh We'll have we'll have more to, to do for Scott later, but I, I did want to acknowledge his long dedicated service to to his fellow North Carolinians and to our office. Um, we have though also said goodbye April first to David Christenberry, who has been one of our preservation architects who works with uh, he had worked with the preservation uh, preservation tax credit program for residences, the state program, and so we are in the process of getting that position filled. Um, but we've also added in some more, uh, as you might recall, Anna Grantham, who's our file room assistant working with Chandria Birch. That's the, the real heart of everything for our office, our survey uh, documentation. Uh, she left right before the pandemic, and now we have welcomed Sharon Hope as her successor in that position. Um, we've also brought on two survey specialists. Uh, one is Rebecca Spanbauer, who's going to be working with surveys that are generated as part of our Section 106 process. Um, and also Kelly Lally Malloy, who some of you might recognize the name Kelly Lally. She wrote the book on Wake County, the historic architecture of Wake County some years ago. Um, and she is going to be working with our hurricane architectural surveys. And just as a reminder, those are going to be getting underway shortly. We actually have seven um, that are county surveys plus a municipal survey. And just as a reminder, uh, we, we've hit all the, the corners of the state here. Uh, Hoke, McDowell, Montgomery. Person, Polk, and Vance. And then as a subgrant, Cumberland County came to us. They would like this information for planning purposes, especially with all the development that's going on there. So Cumberland County, that will be unincorporated areas minus Fort Bragg. Um, and also Mount Pleasant, which is a, a small town in Cabarrus County, very historic. Uh, they have sought uh, monies and received that for a municipal survey as well as stormwater drainage planning because that's one of the, the things that you can ask for as well. So we're looking forward to getting those started and to having our, our new, new to us colleagues uh, working with us as part of this team. So again, I just want to thank everyone for your attendance this morning and for all the hard work of the staff. So thank you very much. Dr. McGill, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to do we're going to have one more introduction because uh, Dr. Brothers has has joined us, um, and then we will jump into uh, 
our presentations for the various properties. Thank you, Dr. McGill. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers, Deputy Director for the North Carolina Arts Council. Thank you for um, being gracious with, with my tardiness. I often have to multitask on Thursdays with the staff meeting. So it's all, always good to, to be here in this space with you and to see everyone. Thank you and welcome. All right, so um, we're gonna start with the Central and Southeastern regions. Uh, and I think Jen Rose is, is first up here um, with the St. Stephen United Methodist Church. Thank you, Alicia. I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see a PowerPoint slide? Awesome, thank you. All right, so um, the first of four properties um, that I will be presenting today for the National Register is St. Stephen United Methodist Church. It is nominated under criterion A, locally significant in the area of African-American ethnic heritage. The congregation has played an important role in the religious, social, and political life of Lexington's Black residents since its formation. It is also nominated under Criterion C, locally significant for architecture. The period of significance is 1921 to 1971. It meets the requirements of Criteria Consideration A for religious properties because it derives its primary significance from its architectural style and historical association. The boundary encompasses all of the 0.21 acre tax parcel historically associated with the 1921 sanctuary. St. Stephen United Methodist Church is located at 102 East 1st Street at the corner of East 1st and North Salisbury. It is about two blocks southeast of Lexington's Main Street. The, this is the congregation's third church building built in 1921. And its design actually incorporates their second church moved to the rear as a classroom wing, which I'll point out in a bit. St. Stephen is the oldest black congregation in the Lexington district of the Western North Carolina Conference. The congregation, in 1868 formed as King's Methodist Church, meeting at a site on Old Greensboro Road. They purchased their first church building in 1874. Note the building highlighted in red at 417 in the upper left map. In 1885, they renamed the church St. Stephen Methodist Episcopal Church. Sadly, a fire destroyed the frame church in 1886. Note it is gone in the map at the upper right. They built their second church in 1892, a Gothic revival frame church. Its presence is shown on the map at the bottom left. Reverend Robert E. Jones became the congregation's first African-American pastor in 1893. With this background, the church as we view it today reflects resilience, growth, and prosperity of St. Stephen's congregation as they expanded and constructed this sanctuary in 1921. The growing congregation needed a larger church. Thus, under Reverend P.I. Wells, they moved the 1892 frame church back on the lot and rotated it to become the church's rear classroom wing. And you can see this here highlighted in yellow on these various images. They built a new sanctuary facing East First Street and uniformly applied the same brick around the exterior. The 1921 building features a front entrance vestibule and bell tower and round arched windows along sides. The classical portico was added about 1950. The church continued to play a central community role through the mid 20th century. St. Stephen served as a social hub for the African-American community, regularly hosting musical programs, plays, church suppers, holiday celebrations, and other events. They encouraged civic and fraternal organizations to hold meetings at the church. 
Female members organized to assist local families with food, shelter, and clothing, and help the congregation with improvements such as purchasing their Hammond electric organ in the 1930s. In the 30s and 40s, women's circles supported Bennett College. In 1939, the church name changed to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. By the mid 1960s, the church had 122 members. Civil rights leader and attorney J. Kenneth Lee recalled St. Stephen's was among Lexington's African-American churches that served as a local strategy center for civil rights movement meetings and planning sessions. Local civil rights activism escalated on June 5th, 1963, when 15 African-Americans were denied admittance to the Carolina Theater and the Lexington Bowling Alley. Resisting desegregation efforts, the following evening, a white mob gathered at the intersection outside St. Stephen and neighboring First United Church of Christ. The mob threw bottles, rocks, and other objects at African-Americans in the crowd, and they retaliated. Shots were fired, resulting in one death and one injury. St. Stephen was damaged by gunfire. The local government appointed a racially diverse Good Neighbor Council who recommended Lexington desegregate immediately. June 13th to 14th is one of the most notable events associated with St. Stephen. On Saturday morning, Reverend Henry Joyner of St. Stephen with Harvey Henderson, Roger Nichols, Betty Haslam's and other local NAACP officials met with the police chief to obtain permission for a peaceful demonstration the following afternoon. Approximately 105 people assembled in the afternoon at St. Stephen and walked to the courthouse where they kneeled, prayed and sang, and then returned to the church. There were reported 500 onlookers who gathered to watch the march and 47 law enforcement officers stationed along the route. After the march, a brief meeting occurred at the church upon the return and then local NAACP youth advisor, Harvey Henderson and nine young men and women conducted a test of the Lexington Municipal Swimming Pool where they paid admission and swam for about 20 minutes before the pool closed for the day. St. Stephen's continues to support community members through its charitable activities under Reverend Dr. Arnetta Beverly who became St. Stephen's first female pastor in 2017. St. Stephen UMC is also nominated under Criterion C as a locally significant example of early to mid 20th century colonial revival style ecclesiastical architecture with a high level of integrity. The symmetrical sanctuary has a traditional front gabled roof form with a projecting entrance and bell tower and displays colonial revival features such as brick walks, round arch stained glass windows and the circa 1950 pedimenter portico. Here are a couple more exterior views walking around the building. Original interior elements have been carefully preserved. Note plaster walls, narrow floorboards, beadboard wainscoting, molded chair rails, tall baseboards, wood window and door surrounds, paneled wood doors, rolling wood overhead doors, and coffered beadboard ceiling. In sum, this property is nominated under Criterion A and C with a period of significance from 1921 to 1971. Alicia, do you want me to break for questions um, after each and unshare the screen or um, go to the next one? I, th I think we can just have you go through the, the next several and then we can take questions. Okay. That's, I think that, that's what we've been doing in the past, unless we anticipate significant discussion and questions. Okay. Sounds good. All right. All right. So now I will share with you uh, my second presentation.
coming weeks. The expansive Georgian Revival style Elizabeth and Bowman Gray Junior House is situated on the western outskirts of Winston-Salem. Here you see its location between Winston-Salem to the east and Louisville to the southwest. The 11.38 acre parcel is the residual tract of Brookberry Farm, which once encompassed three, no, 795 acres. Over the last few decades, most of the farm has been redeveloped into residential subdivisions, as shown at lower right. In 2004, 185 acres of the farm, outlined in orange, was determined eligible through the environmental review process. And since then the eastern end has been redeveloped and the balance is currently or soon to be redeveloped as well. The house was placed on the study list in 2019 and the turquoise line in the image on the left delineates the tax parcel that has been nominated to the National Register. As you can see, the property features significant, sufficient acreage and mature foliage to screen the residential compound at the west end of the parcel from the surrounding modern development, as well as preserve a sense of its original rural setting. In addition to the main house, there are three supporting buildings and structures and a design landscape, all contributing to the historic significance of the property. The house built in 1950 was expanded in 1960 with an indoor swimming pool wing, which as you will see is sited so that its impact on the original construction is minimized to the rear despite the large footprint. Like his father, who was president and chairman of the board of RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company from 1924 until his sudden death in 1935, the younger Bowman Gray rose through the ranks of Reynolds Tobacco, becoming vice president in 1949, sales manager in 1952, executive vice president in 55 and president in 57. Bray led the company in that capacity until 59, when he became chief executive officer, a position he retained through 67. From 59 until his death in 1969, he headed the board of directors. In 1946, Bowman Jr. and his brother Gordon began developing the dairy farm they named Brookberry. Bray and his wife Elizabeth, a Richmond, Virginia native, enjoy the farm's western Forsyth County setting and in 1946, they commissioned prolific Winston-Salem architect, William Roy Wallace, to design a house that expressed their status in the business and social circles. Situated at the top of a knoll, the house is notable due to its size and finely executed classical features typical of the Georgian style of the American colonies as revived during the early to mid 20th century. Wallace emulated colonial Tidewater Virginia plantations as well as the manorial aesthetic and rambling asymmetrical tripartite plan of Bowman Gray's parents' commodious Norman revival home, Grayland, shown at the lower right, which was built in 1932. Here are views of the front of the house. Wallace rendered plans for various Gray family members in Winston-Salem and Roaring Gap between 1928 and 1958. His design for Elizabeth and Bowman Gray Jr.'s residence is the most expansive and sophisticated of these and of most of his other commissions. Now walking around the house to the left, <clears throat> The north side of the north wing is shown at the upper right. And the other two views are of the east side of the house. Here are views of the 1960 pool wing. It's positioned on a sloping site behind the south wing of the house so that it isn't seen from the main facade. And its coverage of the end of the south wing is minimized. The colonial revival aesthetic pervades the interior, which is finely crafted yet unpretentious and remarkably well-preserved. This slide shows the formal public rooms. At bottom left, the center stair hall, as seen upon entering the house. Moving clockwise on the screen are the living room at the end of the hall, the library on the right side of the hall, and the dining room on the left side of the hall. 
As you can see, the woodwork is extensive. Some of it was salvaged from other residences. In the central stair hall and living room, the cornices are plaster. Here are two views on the left of the breakfast room and one of the kitchen, both in the north wing and characterized by highly lacquered woodwork. On the right, the master bedroom in the south wing features a hearth and mantelpiece that were removed from Bowman Gray Sr.'s sitting room at Graylin during its late 1940s renovation. Here are a few views of second floor spaces. Even the bathrooms are remarkably preserved. The porch off the library now serves as the transition to the 1960 pool wing, which is stepped down to minimize the impact on the original house. Designed by A.G. O'Dell and Associates of Charlotte, it mixes classical surrounds with modernist elements, primarily the distinctive V-arched blue laminated timbers spanning the width of the room. And here are a few landscape views. At lower left, the drive going around to the north service area. The, two, the other two lower images are of the fountain terrace east of the rear living room wing. And upper views are looking to the southwest from the terrace, upper right image. And in the middle, looking away from the south end of the pool wing. Elizabeth Gray was an avid gardener. When the house was built, she hired Philadelphia landscape architect Robert G. Campbell to design a comprehensive plan, including a large variety of plants and trees, including boxwood hedges and a terrace. And in 1958, she hired Huntington, New York landscape architects Ortloff and Raymond to expand the colonial revival plan with the addition of the fountain terrace among other modifications. To conclude, the Elizabeth and Bowman Gray Junior House meets criterion C as a remarkably intact and locally significant Forsyth County example of a William Roy Wallace designed Georgian Revival dwelling with 1950, its year of construction being the period of significance. And I will queue up my third. All right. The third nomination I have for you is the Ella Brown Cannon House. The Ella Brown Cannon House is located at 202 South Fulton Street in Salisbury. Although it is contributing within the National Register listed Salisbury Historic District, named the Cannon Gill House, the owner is nominating it individually for its architectural merit. The Cannon House was built between 1904 and 1906 for Ella Brown Cannon. Ms. Cannon was the widow of David Franklin Cannon, a principal investor in the textile manufacturing firm, Cannon Manufacturing Company. Ella Brown Cannon had the house built for herself, her daughter, and her two bachelor brothers. The Ella Brown Cannon House is nominated under Criterion C. Quoting from Mr. Hood's nomination. With its elegant bowed Corinthian portico, the house stands today as an early accomplished fully developed and intact example of the Southern colonial revival style in North Carolina with statewide significance in the area of architecture. It embodies distinctive characteristics of the Southern colonial revival and its period of favor in the state, the opening decades of the 20th century. Its design and construction represent the work of masters by architect James Maxson McMichael and builder Alfred Ross Lazenby. It is an important, masterful design by its architect McMichael. His knowledge and handling of the classical architectural vocabulary, seen in the plan and photos, 
and also in his detailing. And the finish of the mansion are realized at an early date in his career in North Carolina. It anticipates the talent and skills he exhibited into the 1930s in his many handsome classical revival churches for which he is best known throughout North Carolina. The house exhibits a monumental full-scale Corinthian portico and an elaborate hierarchical program of classical woodwork enriching its exterior elevations and interior decoration. The period of significance, 1904 to 1906, coincides with the home's construction dates. The home features a symmetrically balanced facade, as we said, a full height, full facade porch, and forward curved extension, all supported by Corinthian columns. Uh, a broken pediment is over the central entry. It has some wonderful Neo-Palladian detail as seen in the front dormer and in the window over the entrance. Um, the top roof balustrade was restored um, at a later date. <clears throat> Additions were made to the rear of the building between 2006 and 2008. On the upper level, they mimic the house cornice with the medallions and dentals. Um, a bit later, an open air porch was added um, to the right, very near um, the recently built garage. All the alterations are to the rear of the building and are sensitive to the original design. Um, the circa 2002 garage there at the bottom right replaced an earlier garage destroyed during the storm. As you can see, overall, the exterior is quite intact as we work around um, the exterior in a few photos. The interior also retains a high degree of integrity. As you enter into the front hall, notice the treatments around doorways and windows. Panel doors, inlaid wood floors, fluted newel posts, built-in leaded glass cabinets, and the wood mantle. Throughout the other rooms as well, there are a variety of neoclassical mantelpieces and built-ins, and they are overall remarkably intact. Here are some photos of the first floor, moving up to the second floor. The nomination does name designs throughout the state of similar character. And I'll briefly illustrate um, what was in the nominations here with these images. On the left, we have the Charles Oakley Robinson House, Elizabeth City. On the right, the Charles H. Lee House, Monroe. On the left, the Kenneth L. Howard House in Dunn and the President's House in Chapel Hill on the right. Um, on the left, we have the John Bill Johnson House, um, Fuquay Verena. On the right, the Washburn House, um, Washburn in Rutherford County. Um, the other uh, most Comparable house um, in Salisbury is the Robert Lee Wright house, and that is shown on the left. And on the right, we have the Pearsall House in Red Springs. Again, in Red Springs, Nathan Gibson Senior House on the left. Dr. Stephen Sampson Royster House, Shelby, right. And it's mentioned um, by the author in the nomination that um, a comparable property that was um, the earliest and would have preceded the Cannon House is the 1902 Rainy House, which is um, no longer extant. The boundary encompasses the tract historically associated with the Ella Brown Cannon House and garage site. In sum, uh, the Ella Brown Cannon House is nominated to the National Register under Criterion C, significant at the statewide level in the area of architecture, with a period of significance coinciding with construction, 1904 to 1906. I love that mosaic tile with her initials, uh, so I had to throw that in at the end. 
see, and I have one more to share with you. Sorry, they're taking just a little bit of time to, to upload. Okay. All right, and finally, built in 1944, Pilot Hosiery Mill is located in Pilot Mountain in Southeast Surrey County. The property was placed on the study list in 2019. In these two map segments, you can see the mill's location at the Eastern end of Pilot Mountain not far from the town's central business district. Pilot Mountain is nestled at the eastern foot of Pilot Mountain. And if you look closely, you can see that landmark in the distance. The nominated parcel is slightly more than one acre as shown here outlined in red. The town of Pilot Mountain took shape at the end of the 19th century after the 1888 completion of the Cape Fear and Yadkin Valley Railroad, which linked Wilmington and Mount Airy, northwest of Pilot Mountain. The town incorporated in 1889. The railroad and the presence of six mineral spring resorts in the region helped the little town support typical businesses, livery stables, general stores, blacksmiths, tobacco factories, boarding houses, and at least one hotel. In the early 20th century, the town gained a school, electricity, a library, and a movie theater. The photo at the top left is dated 1891, and the other two were taken in the first decade of the 20th century. Hmm. Pilot Mountain Hosiery Mills, incorporated in June 1943, and erected the factory at the southwest corner of East Main and South Academy Streets. The plant was operational within a year but it ceased production in less than two years. Pilot Hosiery Mills Incorporated established in September 1949 by High Point residents, Charles E. Souden and Walter B. Thomas Jr. leased the factory to house a fine gauge men's sock manufacturing operation. The concern expanded the plant twice with the 1956 addition to the front end of the original 1944 building and a 1986 warehouse addition and utilized it until closing in 2011. The red vertical line in the left image marks the north end of the original construction. Now we'll go around the building counterclockwise. Six 12 pane steel casement windows remain in the 1956 addition. Two of the 16 pane 1944 steel casement windows survive in the original portion of the mill. But the wood framing and particle board installed in the window openings as a temporary measure has not impacted opening size sills or lintels. The other noticeable modification is the early 1960s relocation of the primary entrance from the 1956 facade center to the east elevation's North Bay. Yet the entrance opening on the 1956 facade remains clearly delineated and filled with a metal vent that is easily removed. While the building might appear unremarkable architecturally, it epitomizes functional mid 20th century industrial design. The same is true of the interior, which is substantially intact and characterized by the exposed structural system of concrete block exterior walls, steel I-beams and posts, wood joists and rafters and the narrow hardwood first and second story and poured concrete basement floors. Manufacturing and storage areas retain open plans and the office configuration on the 1956 editions second story is intact. Surrey County's first knitting mills were in Mount Erie as early as 1916. It wasn't until a hosiery industry boom in the late 1930s that Pilot Mountain gained its first mill with the creation of Amos and Smith Hosiery Company in 1938. 
the industry flourished into the 1940s when Pilot Hosiery Mills' predecessor at the site, Pilot Mountain Hosiery Mills, began operation in 1944. In 1946, the same year Pilot Mountain Hosiery Mills ceased operation, two other mills opened to Pilot Mountain. Armtex Incorporated and Archbrook Hosiery Mills, followed by Pilot Hosiery Mill in 1949. While Armtex and Archbrook Hosiery were larger, Pilot Hosiery maintained a significant role in the local economy. In a town with few industries, Pilot Hosiery Mill was one of its largest employers, taxpayers, freight shippers, and power consumers. When the plant was operating three daily shifts at maximum capacity in the 1960s and early 70s, approximately 100 employees produced up to 10,000 dozen socks per week. Despite being, um, despite exporting socks to Saudi Arabia in the early 2000s, Pilot Hosiery Mills failed to overcome intense competition within the domestic hosiery industry and adapt to the rapidly changing technology and globalization it negatively impacted the market for American textiles. So the plant ceased operation in 2011. The town's other three mills had closed years earlier. Overall, Pilot Hosiery Mill retains a good level of integrity sufficient for National Register eligibility under Criterion A. The most visible impact on integrity is the 1986 warehouse addition but its location at a lower grade near the mill's south end and its connection to the building's west elevation via a one-story hyphen, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, it obscures only a single basement level bay and minimizes its visual and physical impact on the historic building. Today, Pilot Hosiery Mill stands out as the town's most intact historic textile mill. The Amos and Smith plant was altered over time and redeveloped in 2008 as the pilot center, a Surrey Community College retaining center and a processing and distribution center of an agricultural co-op. Most of the Armtex knitting plant was demolished after suffering extensive damage in a 2016 fire. The location and status of the Skyline plant a small operation that ceased production in the 50s has not been determined. The town's only other known extant industrial building that is more than 50 years old has been extensively altered. Pilot Hosiery Mill is recommended for listing in the National Register under Criterion A for industry due to its role as one of the three primary textile manufacturers driving Pilot Mountain's economy and under Criterion C for architecture as one of the town's few intact mid-century industrial buildings. The period of significance begins with the building's 1944 completion and continues until 1971. Pilot Hosiery Mill's function after 1971 is not of exceptional significance. All right, and that is all for me. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, are there questions or comments about any of the four properties presented by Jen uh, this morning? I just have, as usual, I have a fun fact. Um, back to the um, St. Stephen United Methodist um, connection to Shaw University, the current pastor and the first woman to pastor that church was a Shaw graduate. And she also served on the board of trustees at Bennett College. So she's got strong HBCU connections. Cool, thank you. Other comments or questions? No? Do I, do I hear a, a motion to approve? staff recommendations to uh, list these four properties on the National Register. So moved, Matt Dr. Jorgensen. Johnson. <laughs> I, I don't know who went first, so we'll have uh, uh, Valerie Johnson as our uh, 
first and uh, Matt Jorgensen is our, yeah. our second. All right. Um, so we will move then to our roll call vote. And again, I'm just going to follow my screen here. Um, Mary Lynn Bryan. Yes. All right. Thank you. I vote yes. Uh, David Denard. Yes. Thank you. David Bergstone. Yes. Thank you. Tamar Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Terry Russ. Yes. Kristen Baldwin Detheridge. Oh, you're muted. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it wouldn't unmute. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. I think that's everybody here. So um, that's unanimous. Um, thank you. So I, I am going to have us take a, a quick break um, before we have um, move on to Hannah's presentations. And what we will do after the break, just as a reminder, we'll have Hannah present the um, John N. Smith Cemetery, um, the Sanford District, and then we will have uh, Terry Russ and Valerie Johnson recuse themselves for the Oak Crest. We'll, then we'll vote. Then we will have the two of you recuse yourselves for the discussion of the Gravesfield House um, and have you come back in um, after we vote. So, okay. and we have to leave completely from the meeting and then come back in. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I have both of your numbers, and so I'll text you. But let's let's take a quick um, five minute break. This isn't the. We'll we'll come back at eleven twenty nine, and I'll see everybody in a moment. Try to stay in the Zoom meeting if you can.
here. Um, and Hannah, I saw you are here too. <laughs> so um, great. Okay. Um, so just uh, just as a reminder, and um, for, for Fred, who has just joined us, um, Fred, I'll have you introduce yourself in a sec here, but we are going to have Hannah Beckman Black um, do the first two properties um, that, that she planned to present. And then um, we will have three people recusing themselves um, for the discussion of the, then we will vote. Then we will have three people recuse themselves for the Oak Crest Graves Fields House um, discussion and vote. And then we will have those people come back. Um, Fred, if you could send me your phone number in a private message through the chat room, and then I'll text you about that, um, like when we have you come back. Um, and Fred, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, my apologies for being late. Uh, my name is Fred Belladin. I am a principal with Clearscapes Architects. I live in Raleigh, and um, we have the privilege of doing a lot of historic tax credit work. So I immensely enjoy being a part of this group. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. All right, Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alicia. Pull up my presentation. You're a little quiet on. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. I think I was, I think I was talking quietly. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I wasn't um, sure if it was volume or like on the computer or, or your voice. So you're good now. Um, so my first property is the John N. Smith Cemetery, located in the coastal Brunswick County town of Southport, a, a few blocks north of the 1980 Southport Historic District. Um, it's indicated here by the red arrow. The John N. Smith Cemetery is locally significant under Criterion A in the areas of social history and African American ethnic heritage as Southport's only community cemetery for African-Americans from reconstruction through the Jim Crow era of legalized segregation. And with the loss of many historically black re local resources from this period, the cemetery retains an important tangible resource representing this community's history. The cemetery meets criteria consideration D as it derives its primary significance from age, manifestation of traditional African-American burial practices and as a rare remaining historic resource associated with this population. The period of significance spans from 1874, the date of the earliest marked burial for the cemetery, um, is for the cemetery's namesake, John N. Smith, until the nearby Northwood Cemetery was desegregated in 1974. After the Civil War, African-Americans settled in two distinct neighborhoods in Southport, a larger area west of North Howe Street, labeled number one on the map, and a smaller area flanking Jabbertown Road, which is labeled number two on the map. Over time, the community grew with the construction of homes, churches, schools, civic organizations, and a small business district. Many of these earlier resources were replaced by new construction or lost over time. The cemetery was formally established in 1880 when trustees of what became the St. James AME Zion Church, the town's only black congregation at the time, purchased the original two acres of land. Over the years, four additional local churches were established and all five congregations shared the cemetery. In 1949, an additional one and a half acres were, were added to the south end of the property. It remains an active burial ground, and in 2011, a nonprofit called the John N. Smith Cemetery Restoration and Preservation Inc. was formed to preserve, restore, and maintain the cemetery and to promote its historical significance. Approximately 479 grave markers in the cemetery have been counted and are shown on this map. As many as 350 marked burials date within the period of significance while five markers have death dates prior to the cemetery's founding. As this map shows, most marked graves are concentrated at the cemetery's newer Southern section. However, GPR surveys in 2017 and 18 revealed an additional 1,243 unmarked graves for a total of approximately 1,722 graves. 
This large collection of internments encompasses the full spectrum of African-American society in Southport. As the nomination notes, from farmers to fishermen, factory workers, domestic servants, laborers, watermen, carpenters, masons, homemakers, funeral directors, pastors, merchants, nurses, midwives, doctors, and teachers. The John N. Smith Cemetery displays physical characteristics of late 19th and early 20th century African-American cemeteries, including its layout, minimal landscaping, and types of vernacular and professionally carved grave markers. And it retains very good overall historic integrity. Many graves once had characteristics common in Gullah Geechee burial practices, including shells covering the grave sites, as shown in this 1950 photo of the cemetery. While many graves have lost this decorative feature over time, local descendants have continued to maintain shell placement on some graves as shown in this more recent photo. There are scores of professionally made and vernacular grave markers in, the, in materials including fieldstone, marble, granite, and concrete. Here are some of the marble commercially made examples, including the grave marker of John N. Smith, as I mentioned earlier, the earliest known um, burial in the cemetery. Here's a concrete vernacular example, and several granite examples. Only six family plots are fully or partially bordered with formed concrete or concrete block. Here you can see a, a family plot, and here's another bordered family plot. The boundary was informed by the GPR survey and is drawn to contain all known marked and un unmarked graves, including those in the public right of way along Cape Harbor Drive. It also includes access to the graveyard along East Leonard Street. In sum, the John N. Smith Cemetery is locally significant under Criterion A in the areas of social history and African American ethnic heritage while meeting criteria consideration D for cemeteries and with a period of significance spanning from 1874 through 1974. And my next presentation is for the downtown Sanford Historic District, additional documentation, boundary increase and boundary decrease. And this nomination was funded with a certified local government uh, grant from our office. The district is located in Lake County seat of Sanford and was originally listed in 1985. Shown in the red circle, it encompasses Sanford's central business area consisting of fairly compact commercial and industrial development. The district abuts two primarily residential national register districts to the north and one to the east. Established in 1872 at the intersection of two rail lines Sanford grew as the center of trade and retail for the surrounding rural communities and was known for its brownstone quarrying and brick making industries, as well as textile, tobacco, and furniture manufacturing. The original district was listed for local significance under Criterion A in the areas of commerce, transportation, exploration and settlement, and politics and government. It was listed under Criterion C for architecture as a collection of buildings that embody the distinctive characteristics of late 19th and early 20th century commercial architecture. And it was also listed under Criterion D for potential to yield information in historic archeology. span However, the narrative for the original nomination did not adequately support significance in the areas of exploration and settlement and politics and government, nor did it support listing under Criterion D for archeology. span Conversely, while industrial history was acknowledged in the district, it was not included as an area of significance. The original period of significance begins in 1872 with the construction of the earliest above ground resource, the railroad house, and ended in 1935, 50 years from when the nomination was written. However, Sanford's downtown continued to grow steadily into the mid 20th century, and by arbitrarily ending the period of significance in 1935, Several mid-century buildings in downtown were non-contributing due to age or excluded from the boundary altogether. So this nomination addresses the limit, limitations of the 1985 district nomination 
through additional documentation and a boundary increase in three areas. It also includes a, a small boundary decrease in three areas to remove vacant lots, as well as one altered and one later commercial building. The additional documentation recognizes important mid-century growth within the original district boundaries as Sanford continued to be a center of commercial and industrial activities for the county. The revised period of significance extends to circa 1972 with the construction of the first citizens bank and trust building, after which new construction slowed considerably in downtown. The additional documentation includes expanded historic background and context in the areas of architecture and commerce through the early 1970s. The revised architecture context goes more into detail about the various styles found within the district, including Queen Anne, Gothic Revival, Art Deco, Craftsman, Tudor Revival, Colonial Revival, and Commercial Style, although most buildings in the district are vernacular, commercial, and industrial buildings. It adds industry as an area of significance while providing a more robust context in the, for the industrial importance of downtown Sanford. And furthermore, it, it, um, the document adds significance in the areas of African-American ethnic heritage and civil rights within the district as the site of civil rights demonstrations, including sit-ins, boycotts, and marches in 1963. As a result, the city formed a human relations committee that worked to investigate the challenges facing African-Americans in the community and to work towards equal access to restaurants, stores, and parks in downtown Sanford. The additional documentation serves to correct the original document by removing exploration and settlement and politics and government as areas of significance, as well as criterion D for archaeology, all of which were not supported by the original document. Boundaries contain two individually listed properties. First is the railroad house listed in 1972, significant in the areas of transportation and architecture. The other is the 1925 Temple Theater listed in 1983 and significant in the areas of entertainment and recreation and architecture. And because significance in the area of entertainment and recreation was omitted in the original nomination, it has been added to the additional documentation form. The updated section seven inventory contains new property descriptions, updated contributing and non-contributing statuses, and accounts for any material changes, new builds or demolitions through 1985, uh, since the 1985 nomination was written. The revised resource count for additional documentation includes 83 primary contributing resources and 16 primary non-contributing resources. And these are just three of the buildings that were previously non-contributing that are now uh, changed to contributing as part of this nomination. The boundary increase expands the district in three different areas with 11 contributing primary buildings and one non-contributing secondary building. Buildings in the boundary increase like those constructed throughout the district in the mid 20th century illustrate continued evolution of downtown Sanford through the period and share the same development history. Additional context is provided for commercial, industrial and architectural significance in the boundary increase. Um, the period of significance for the boundary increase extends from 1902, the date of the earliest section of the Sanford Furniture Company, to circa 1965 to incorporate, incorporate facade updates to the Johnson Cotton Company building. Increase area A includes a single building, the circa 1956 Modernist Carolina Power and Light Company. Increase area B is the largest of the three. At the north is a complex constructed for the Sanford Furniture Company between 1902 and circa 1955 with some later additions. And this area includes the one non-contributing non secondary building, which is a circa 1977 garage, you can see right here. Next uh, in area B, the top photo is a circa 1960 Sanford Furniture Company office. Next to that is the 1938 Art Deco National Guard Armory, then a pair of 1940s commercial buildings, and below that, a circa 1940 building for the Fairview Dairy. 
Area C includes three buildings. The top photo is the circa 1935 Lawrence livery stable. Below that is the Johnson, Johnson Cotton Company building constructed in circa 1944 with a circa 1965 modern facade. And to the right of that is the Central Electric Membership Corporation building constructed in 1950. This document also includes three small boundary decrease areas. Area A removes vacant lots that were two houses, where two houses once stood. Area B removes a commercial building constructed in 1987 after the original district was listed and some uh, excess vacant lots just north of the building. And Area C removes the commercial building at 309 Chatham Street, a portion of which has been demolished since 1985 and excess vacant lots where other buildings once stood. The buildings that remain outside of the boundaries were not included because they were constructed later than the mid 20th century. They were separated from the contiguous district by large vacant lots, um, or they were highly altered. And overall resources in the original boundary and increase areas have very good historic integrity. So here's a summary of all the things that these three actions do, the additional documentation, boundary increase and boundary decrease. And I also want to note that we received CLG comment from the mayor and um, the Stanford Historic Preservation Commission that they believe the nominations meet criteria for listing or removal from the existing district boundary in the case of the boundary decrease areas. And that's all I have for those two. Thank so you. Anna. Any questions? Thank you. Um, Dr. Johnson here. Um, just one comment back to the um, the John N. Smith Cemetery. Well, actually, two comments. One is a tiny one. In the nomination form, Geechee should be most it, instead of how it's spelled with the I at the end. It has two E's at the end. Um, it's Gullah Geechee. Okay. Um, it's the more accepted form. And on that note, that cemetery is in the county that falls within the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. And I think that should be um, a little amplified a little bit in the, the nomination so that because it's that's part of the National Park Service and that just, I think, strengthens the the claim which I really do, I, I look at the, the grave site and say that's that's some gully geeky stuff right there. Um and that is also very important for those of us who are part of the gully geeky diaspora. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions. Other comments, questions? Uh, David Denard here. I have a, a question and a comment. And my comment is that uh, uh, this was a very, very interesting uh, uh, report. Uh, and I was struck by the extensive research uh, uh, that was done, especially on the cemetery and then with regard to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Sanford area, uh, the ethnic heritage of, of, uh, of African Americans. I had one question, though, in the John N. Smith Cemetery, that was a reference to uh, Abraham Galloway, uh, and a headstone listed for him 1846 to 1927. And I wanted to know if this is the Abram, Abraham Galloway, uh, the fiery Civil War uh, African-American that uh, uh, David Soselsky, you know, has written extensively about, uh, or if this is another Abraham Galloway, uh, because the Abraham Galloway that we know is the fiery revolutionary uh, uh, had a shorter lifespan uh, uh, from about the uh, 
1830s to the 1870s, about 1870. Uh, uh, nothing like uh, 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 1846 to 1927. Um, I do not know so the answer to that. Uh, but that's certainly something, um, you know, we could either have the consultant look into or, or look into ourselves as well. Okay. This is Ramona. If I'm not mistaken, the Abraham Galloway that you're referring to and I'm thinking of was born in Smithville, which became Southport. Is that not correct? That the famous Abraham Galloway. Yes. I I I, I do wonder if there is a connection. I, I thought the same thing, so. Okay, yeah, because uh uh, Sosowski has his, uh, his birth listed as 1837 and his death date as uh, uh, 1870. Uh, we know, you know, he was, it was quite young. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that, that's what I was concerned about when I saw the headstone. Uh, now, there is a, we spell Abraham Galloway. A B R A H A M, and the name here is Abram Galloway. So it could be another uh, uh, Galloway. Yes, sir, Doctor Denard. Uh, I just I just looked up that particular Mister Galloway, Abram Galloway, and he is seems to be buried under a U.S. Colored Troops Veterans marker, which I think is also very interesting. Okay. Okay, and so 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 check on the confusion there to uh, right. to to clarify this uh, Abram uh, Abram Galloway Abraham Galloway uh, uh, the fiery uh, uh, revolutionary African American leader uh, during the yes. Civil War who had a considerably short uh, lifespan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If I can interrupt, we've been working. Alicia, this is John Wood. If I can interrupt just a second. We've been working on a signage program in New Bern, and my understanding was that Abraham Galloway was buried in um, either Pine Forest Cemetery in Wilmington or Pine, I think it's Pine Forest Cemetery in Wilmington is where he's supposed to be buried, is my belief. I can check on that to be sure. Okay. Thank you. So this could, this could, this could very easily be another Abram Galloway. Yes, sir. I, I was just looking at find a grave, which, you know, catalogs marked graves um, in surveyed cemeteries. And there, there are multiple Galloways, a Abram, Abraham, and otherwise in the John Smith Cemetery. So I, I, it seems like that's a, a name that may be more common in Smith than Smithville and now Southport. Okay. But potentially re relations, right? Yeah, so... Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments and, and the discussion. Other comments or questions? I had one question. Occasionally in the nomination, kids refer to a graveyard, but it was never affiliated with the one church. So, right? It was always a common area, not, not a graveyard, it's always a cemetery. Right. So, and I don't know, I can't recall where exactly that initial church was in relation to the, the cemetery, uh, but they were never um, close by each other. And uh, I don't, none of the, none of the other um, churches um, ended up having cemeteries uh, or graveyards associated with their, with their churches. Yeah. It looked like the 20th century was the first one that was you know, directly connected but I mean, I deal with this all the time. And it's graveyards or church connected to a church physically, and you know, cemeteries are not. So, I mean, terminology sometimes is confused. Or, you know, graveyard can be a cemetery, but not all cemeteries are graveyards. So. Thank you for that. Anyone else? All right, he hearing or seeing no other uh, questions or comments, is there a, a motion to approve staff recommendations for the John N. Smith Cemetery and the Sanford Historic District for um, 
listing and changes on the National Register. Uh, David Denard, I move approved. Thank you. I second. Who was the second? I didn't. Uh, Bergstone. David David. Okay. <laughs> I heard it, but I didn't see it. Okay. Thank you. Well, we will move into our roll call vote. And again, I'm just going to go through my screen. Uh, Dr. Bryan. You're muted, but it looked like you said yes. In just a minute. Yes. Thank you. I vote yes. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Matt Jorgensen. I, you're muted. Sorry, my space bar wasn't working. Uh, yes. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Terry Russ. You're also muted. Huh, space bar is not working anymore. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Baldwin Dethridge. Yes, that's what happened to me earlier too. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's, um, and I think that is everyone. So that's unanimous. Um, and thank you, Hannah, for the presentations. I will now ask uh, Fred Belladin, Valerie Johnson, and Terry Russ to please um, recuse themselves from the discussion regarding um, the Oak Crest, should they stay though for the name change um, commentary, Sarah? Um, I, don't, I don't think that's necessary. I would just have them uh, recuse themselves for the whole, the okay. whole thing. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so go ahead and please leave the meeting um, and then I will text you all and uh, give you a heads up um, after we vote. Fred, you have a, a question? Just to be clear, would you like us to log out or just leave? Um, I think I think it's fine if you just. Oh, you mean like physically just leave, or I think please log out. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. And we'll see you soon, Dr. McGill. For the record, I think we still maintain a quorum yes yes that's what that that's what i thought with with my records but thank thank you for um double checking <laughs> so um okay so uh uh hannah if you want to give us the presentation and sure let me pull it back up um So um, the Graves Fields House is my final nomination to present to you today. Um, on the agenda, we had it listed as Oak Crest, which was the name given to the property historically. However, within the last week, we were asked to change it to the Graves Fields House to recognize the names of the two families who, uh, that owned it for the longest period of time. So the name will be changed throughout the nomination before uh, it is sent to the, to the National Park Service if it is approved today. Located in the historic Freedman's Village of Oberlin in Raleigh, indicated here by the Red Star, the Graves Fields House is a circa 1886 two-story Queen Anne style house built onto a circa 1865 one-story house with modest Greek revival styling at the rear. And there's also a 2020 rear addition. Previously listed as the Willis M. Graves House, it was one of three houses along Oberlin Road individually listed in 2002 to the National Register after the approval of the multiple property documentation form for Oberlin Village. The other two are the Reverend Plummer T. Hall House and the John T. and Mary, Mary Turner House. And here's what they all looked like around the time of listing. According to the original nomination, the Graves House was constructed by one of the most prominent Oberlin Village residents, Willis M. Graves, an African-American brick mason who also held civic, civic positions, including justice of the peace and an officer at the Wilson Temple United Methodist Church. It was originally listed under Criterion A in the areas of African-American ethnic heritage and social history, 
locally significant as a symbol of the financial and social success that was possible for residents of Oberlin, in spite of the challenges of racism and poverty in the wake of the Civil War and Reconstruction. In 2019, the Graves Fields House was moved from its original parcel south of the Oberlin Baptist Church to a shared parcel north of the church with the Hall House. The Hall House was moved back from the road and a bit north on the parcel, and both were rehabilitated for Preservation North Carolina's headquarters. Prior to the move, an archeological study of the new site was con conducted and care was taken to ensure the relocation of the buildings um, would, would not adversely impact the site. And here's what they look like today after the move and the rehabilitation that was complete. The Hall House had prior approval from the Park Service in 2015 to be listed throughout the move, but the Graves Fields House needed to be moved more quickly without prior approval from the Park Service as it was under threat of demolition when its lot was purchased for redevelopment. As a result, it was delisted, but in 2020 was placed on the study list at its new location. Because the relationship of the Graves Fields House um, and its original site was broken during the move, it cannot be renominated under Criterion A. However, as you can see in these two photos, the integrity of the house was greatly improved, particularly with the removal of later siding to reveal historic wood siding. And due to the rehabilitation efforts, the house now retains sufficient integrity to convey its significance at the local level under Criterion C for architecture as an, intact, an excellent and intact example of the Queen Anne style. It meets criteria consideration B for moved properties as it retains integrity and derives its significance primarily for, from its architectural value. And the period of significance is circa 1886, corresponding to the approximate year it achieved its Queen Anne appearance. The front elevation displays quintessential Queen Anne detailing with asymmetrical massing and a, a polygonal bay at one end and a tower at the other, stained glass windows, shingled gables, and spindle work detailing at the porch. This slide shows uh, the circa 1865 portion in the 2020 rear edition, which replaced other small 20th century editions deemed not architecturally significant and demolished prior to the move. On the interior, the floor plan and character defining details remain throughout. During the rehabilitation, later closets were removed and deteriorated plaster walls and ceilings were replaced with drywall, but otherwise finishes and features were mostly retained and repaired and include Queen Anne mantles, beadboard, wainscot, and reeded trim. So here is the center stair hall. One of the front rooms and the other front room. These are views of the circa 1865 portion and interior detailing received updates in the 1880s to match the Queen Anne style features in the rest of the house. Here's a view of that new rear addition. Here is the upstairs hallway and some details in the upstairs bedrooms. The boundary encompasses the building footprint since the parcel is not historically associated with the Graves Fields House. In sum, in its new location, the Graves Fields House retains necessary integrity to convey its local significance under Criterion A for architecture, also meeting criteria consider consideration B for moved houses with a period of significance of circa 1886. And we also received CLG comment from the mayor uh, of Raleigh and the Raleigh Historic District Commission that they believe this nomination meets criteria for listing. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Um, this is Matt Jorgensen. I had a question, but actually I was gonna ask Hannah if she could go back to a slide, the slide that showed the before and after together. Yes. Uh, Mike, I'm just curious. It seemed like the before had um, some many porch elements that were not in the after. Um, if anything, those things looked 
maybe more modern, but I'm wondering is the sort of the changes to the front porch, um, does it make it even more historic in character or, or um, how do those changes affect the integrity of the house? Uh, yes, okay, so, so it looks like um, there were some craftsmen style. And that awning porch. thing. And the awning, yes. So um, they they um, replaced the, the the porch elements um, that were no longer there to match what was is, was there at the time, and kind of restored it to that period when it, it had that Queen Anne style. Um, so um, in that restoration, um, it, it actually heightened the heightened the um, integrity and also the removal of this awning you can now see these really wonderful spindle work uh, details in the frieze of the porch. So it, it all improved the integrity. Excellent, the thank you. Well, they, they did. This, is, this is Kristen Dethrich. I'm curious, so are you saying that the, the detailing at the top of the porch was under that metal awning? And so what Absolutely. we're seeing is rehabilitated extant material. Yes, that is correct. It, it was um, underneath that poor Johnny. Mm. And I'll just add that the balustrade was a, um, a later change and they restored it based on historic photographs. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? I, I have... Um, Two comments, I guess. Um, one is that I, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate the um, the name change. That I, um, being a, a active member of Friends of Overland Village, I knew that there was some community concerns about um, the change to Oakcrest, and uh, and I love that stained glass window, and I understood the sort of um, uh, homage to the that original naming and the architecture, but I also appreciated that um, that the PNC and the um, author of the report were um, so and Shippo was supportive of of changing that name. And I, and I understand that Oakcrest will still be a secondary name in the report. Is that correct? That's correct. It will still be listed on the form as a, a other name. Yeah, great. Um, and then my only other comment is that um, I know that in the in the community um, tradition has it and sort of um, uh, there is an acknowledgement or a, a um, idea that uh, the Oberlin village continued south to to Hillsboro Street um, rather than Everett and I was sort of revisiting historic maps and it's it it's really hard to sort of identify um, historic documentation of that um, but I just wanted to sort of make a note that um, at least in the community there is a um, acknowledgement of the um, historic village extending further south than what is in the report. I don't know if there can be sort of like a, a note in there or something like that, but. Certainly, that's something you can, you can add. Um, and I think that's it on, on my end. Any other comments or questions? Is there a motion to approve staff recommendations for uh, relisting uh, the Graves Fields House on um, the National Register. Maybe I, I move to approve. <laughs> I'll second. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll go through our vote. Um, Dr. Brian, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Denard. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. Matt Jorgensen. Yes. David Bergstone. Yes. And that's all of us. Is that right? I, I didn't miss anybody, right? Okay. <laughs> um, great. Um, so uh, that is uh, unanimous. Um, and I will um, message uh, everybody to have them come back to the meeting. Um, 
of the Zebulun district and conversation, it may mean that we will take a slightly later. Alicia? Yes. I don't know if it was for everyone, but you froze for a little bit. That's so what, okay. What I you said for... between I'll contact them and Zebulun district, I missed. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I had a note for that. I had an, an unstable connection. I'm going to turn off my video for a sec and then I'm going to turn myself back on that usually does it. Am I okay now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I was planning on having us have the um, Zebulon presentation before lunch, since we did take an 11th, uh, a break around 1130. Um, and I hope that sounds reasonable. I know this is not like a democracy that we all vote about whether or not we, um, but I, I, I think it would be good for us to try and get through that um, discussion before lunch. Um, and, uh, and also we may have members of the public who have been sort of waiting for that discussion in the, the live stream. Um, so I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna message everybody to come back and have Sarah give her presentation. And, I, and Sarah, I understand that Jen's gonna make some comments beforehand. Okay. Yes. I'm just trying to get this to start up. Okay. Are y'all seeing the presentation? Yes. Excellent. All right. Um, whenever everyone has rejoined, uh, Jen will give us a little um, kind of a recap of how we sort of how we got here. Yeah, Alicia, let me know if we have everyone back. I I will. I'm I'm still working on my text. <laughs> Sorry, I should have I should have pre-written it, but <laughs> no worries. Is it okay that I'm back? Okay. Yes, yes thank yes, you. It is. I'm I'm in the process of of texting people, but um, uh, yeah, I, had, I had a friend who was watching the YouTube and yeah. she said, I think they're done. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> All right, they've been messaged, but I haven't seen them sign back on yet here. I'm worried my text didn't go through. I'm going to try an email. I'm sorry. Dr. McGill, Dr. Johnson is back. Okay. Well, that's good. Great. Thank you. Then I will just try a text to Fred and an email.
and messaged Fred again. Please tell me if you see him come back on the screen too. I'm like jumping through my squares here. <laughs> I see him sign them on now. All right, everyone is back now. So, um, Jen, if you want to make your comments and. Okay. Thank you, Alicia, for gathering everyone. All right, so next up. Um, we have the Zebulon Historic District for consideration. And I think um, many or most of you were here in February, um, but it was um, deferred at the February meeting and not presented um, with recommendation to um, come back at the June meeting. Um, as such, I will give a little bit of project background to bring us, um, make sure we're back where we need to be for today. And then um, Sarah will go ahead and give the district presentation for your consideration. All right, so um, this project uh, startup dates to 2016. And in 2016, uh, SHPO first communicated with the public and local governments and staff about National Register potential. Um, SHPO presented the district scoping map um, which is the map at the far left in September 2016 at a Zebulon Commission um, work session. And also in 2016, um, local residents formed Preservation Zebulon. In 2017, um, the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission applied for a National Park Service pass-through grant uh, awarded by SHPO to update Zebulon survey, um, which would, which was planned to result in study list um, for individual properties and um, any eligible districts. Next slide, please. Uh, 2018 was a phase of survey work, uh, study list action and um, hiring a consultant. Um, in 2018, Wake County HPC hired New South Associates as a consultant to undertake the Zebulon Survey Project. And the project scope included record, recordation of many properties um, dating through the 1970, including survey of approximately 340 properties in the proposed district, um, which was delineated on maps attached to the RFP in 2018, um, that was the same map shown on the previous slide, which had been scoped in 2016. The um, project contract um, among, among the scoping items 
um, said there would be a press release issued by the Wake County Public Affairs um, at the project outset for the survey and participation by the consultant in up to two public meetings organized by the town of Zebulon and Wake County HPC. In August 2018, um, the SHPO and New South presented preliminary findings to the Zebulon Board of Commissions and Zebulon staff. The presentation included a National Register eligible historic district to be proposed for the North Carolina study list. And the session included um, afterwards question and answer clarifying whether the National Register places any restrictions on development and uh, how the historic district would help develop three main focal points of the town strategic plan. In November um, 2018, New South presented findings from the survey at a public presentation um, at the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Next slide, please. And um, as you may remember in 2018, the National Register Advisory Committee, you all, approved the Zebulon Historic District for the North Carolina National Register study list. Um, that was the October 2018 meeting. Um, boundaries are very similar to those circulating since 2016. And the study list boundary is um, the map on the right with the green shading shown in our HPO web. Property owners um, wish to pursue a study list district with interest in um, potential rehab tax credits. Um, the town indicated uh, in 2018, they would not have funding to contribute uh, to the proposed to start district at that time. So also in 2018, Preservation Zebulon um, hires Firefly Preservation Consulting to draft a National Register nomination for the Zebulon Historic District. Um, the following year, 2019, throughout the year, Firefly worked on the National Register nomination. In January 2019, Zebulon staff and Mayor Preservation Zebulon, Wake County HPC staff, and Shippo met at Zebulon City Hall to discuss proposed National Register District and the National Register process. In February 2019, SHPO staff presented National Register and tax credit information at the town um, at a retreat for the um, city council members. Uh, preservation HPO staff um, stated that Zebulon would submit at this time in early 2019 um, to communicate to the town of Zebulon and everyone that the, the town would be submitting comments through the federal certified local government process per staff's understanding of, um, of implications of the interlocal agreement that had been established between Zebulon and Wake County. In April and May of 2019, Preservation Zebulon um, continues meetings with town officials and staff and Preservation Zebulon mails 300 letters to property owners in July. In December 2019, consultants uh, submits a first draft of this district to the State Historic Preservation Office to be carried through the National Register process. And in 2020, um, Preservation Zebulon meets with town officials in February and March. In the summer 2020 to assist staff preparing August uh, virtual NRAC. Remember that was our first uh, virtual meeting. <laughs> HPO had a newly hired certified local government coordinator, um, Christy, who joined us in 2020, um, shifting over from the National Register Assistant position to become a certified local government coordinator. And in coordinating with the National Park Service, um, a conversation about a different, a different property in a different county realizes that the Park Service um, does not recognize interlocal government agreements for the purposes of National Register commenting. So knowing that that was a departure from what all the county HPCs and our office had always been um, trained as far as uh, commenting um, was that they would fill out the forms, the CLG forms. Um, so we had a video call in, November, once we knew that the nomination was nearing completion and appeared to be viable, um, November 20th, SHPO staff met with Gary Roth, 
of Wake County Historic Preservation Commission and encourage them to submit nomination comments, but not through the CLG process. And on December 4th, similarly, um, we've been working to schedule a meeting with the uh, town. So SHPO staff held a similar conversation with um, Mayor Matheny and town manager Joe Moore, December 4th. And December 22nd, we received a complete and correct final draft of the nomination from the consultants. And it met the draft deadline, um, being ready for consideration at the February 2021 NRAC meeting, which um, takes us to recent recollection. Um, in early 2021, Zebulon sent 300 letters to property owners about the upcoming NRAC February meeting and placed the federally required legal ad in the newspaper. Um, SHPO undertook all federally required public and local government noticing of the upcoming NRAC meeting. Um, SHPO and Firefly participated in a public meeting to present the final district nomination. In, so in February, NRAC um, defers um, without hearing the nomination, um, defers it to this meeting, June 10th, and asks um, that the town's request to be given more time for public engagement um, be allowed. And they had concerns due to COVID um, about people not being able to meet in person and discuss the nomination. And in March, um, HPO staff asked for the town's concerns um, and input to be um, summarized in writing so we could see if we can help address anything. On March 17th, we asked um, with specific deadlines for submission of the written comments so we can accommodate all the, the legal notification deadlines prior to the June meeting. Um, Asking repeatedly in March and April for concerns in writing, um, we did not receive them by the deadlines for the June NRAC meeting. HPO um, then undertook all federally required public and local government noticing prior to this June 10th NRAC meeting. And in May, um, SHPO participated in an interview with the mayor for the Mayor Show YouTube channel and also presented at a public community meeting held um, regarding the district. And the town at this um, meeting presented a map with a desire to exclude mid-century residential buildings from the northern portion of the proposed historic district. Shepo answered questions and provided information to the town in May for their June 2021 town commission meeting. And that brings us um, full circle to our presentation today. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, so this is a map uh, just helping to compare the 2016 um, district that we sort of started thinking about on the left and then what came forward with the nomination that you're considering today on the right. And you'll see this map in the comparison again. Um, so the Zebulon Historic District is located in Eastern Waste Wake County, indicated here by the red arrow. The Zebulon Historic District encompasses an intact collection of Zebulon's historic commercial, residential, and institutional buildings constructed following the 1906 arrival of the Raleigh and Pamlico Sound Railroad and the town's establishment shortly thereafter. The period of significance begins in 1906 with the construction of the district's earliest resources and ends in, 19, in 1971 to include the town's modernist style resources, specifically the 1971 Central Carolina Bank and Trust, and to reflect a sharp decline in the construction of mid 20th century resources as most of the lots were built out by 1971. The district is locally significant under criterion A for commerce as an important trading center for Eastern Wake County and nearby Franklin, Nash, Wilson, and Johnston County. Zebulon's commercial core extends north from the railroad, which forms the southern boundary of the district and is concentrated along north of Rundle Avenue, Vance, and Horton Streets. Zebulon's commercial areas serve townspeople, local farmers, and travelers alike complete with shops, hotels, restaurants, banks, and a post office. Downtown also offered professional services, civic activities, and entertainment. Zebulon's commercial significance continued into the mid-century mid as evidenced by the construction of approximately 14 new buildings within the district's commercial core between 1945 and 1971. 
Several buildings, like the Shambly Garage and Stables, shown in the bottom two photographs, were first constructed earlier but received mid-century alterations. Both these buildings were originally constructed around 1920 but received facade updates around 1950. It is also significant under Criterion A in the area of community planning and development as an example of a town-wide grid plan platted in two primary sections, the southern portion during the early 20th century and the northern in the mid 20th century. The Zebulon Land Company purchased about 100 acres adjacent to the newly constructed railroad in 1906, platting this land by 1908. The town was arranged on a grid pattern, considered the most efficient and cost-effective subdivision method at the time. Commercial blocks had narrow lots suitable for storefronts and wide roads for heavier traffic, while the residential areas featured wider lots and narrower streets. As Zebulon's population continued to grow through the early, early to mid 20th century, driven in part by expanding industry in Zebulon following the Great Depression, and in part by veterans returning from World War II, the residential area expanded north toward the 1909 Wake Lawn School, which anchors the north end of the district. This area was originally surveyed and subdivided in 1907. However, it did not, immediate, did not develop immediately and was replatted as Wake Lawn Heights in 1954. It followed the same grid pattern street layout as the earlier section. The district is locally significant under Criterion C for architecture. It includes an intact collection of vernacular and hostile buildings demonstrating popular national trends during the early to mid 20th century. Early architectural styles are concentrated at the southern section of the district and include Queen Anne, Colonial Revival, Georgian Revival, Italian Renaissance Revival, Craftsman, and Period Cottages. Vernacular houses represent some of the earliest buildings in the historic district and typically, typically feature pared down Queen Anne, colonial revival, or craftsman detailing. Commercial and institutional buildings are typically one or two story vernacular brick buildings with minimal detailing. However, there is one Italianate style building, the Citizens Drug Company. The northern end of the district has a concentration of mid 20th century styles, including minimal traditional, Ranch houses, which make up about one third of the district and demonstrate three subtypes, archetypal, colonial revival, and contemporary, and modernist buildings. The district contains two individually listed resources, the Wake Lawn School listed in 1976 under Criterion A for Education and Criterion C for Architecture, was constructed in 1909 to serve elementary and high school students, and features elements of both the Italianate and neoclassical styles. Because of, its inclusion, it, because of its inclusion, the district has an added area of significance for education. The 1914 George, George and Neva Barbie House, listed in 2007 under Criterion C for architecture, is an intact example of a craftsman style four square house. The district includes 241 contributing primary and 79 contributing secondary resources. Only 45 primary resources and 46 secondary resources are non-contributing. There is little infill construction in the district and few substantial additions or alterations have been made to the building. The district, oops, let's see. The district is bound on all sides by later construction, vacant lots, or buildings that have been highly altered and no longer have material integrity to convey their significance. North of the district is the highway and some new commercial construction. On the west, there is a more recent housing development. There's a pocket of new development here in the center of town. And south of the district, there is a higher concentration of alter, altered buildings and later construction, particularly along West Horton Street and Vance Street. Farther south along Barbie Street is an area of town that was historically African-American. Directly south of the train tracks, particularly near the intersection of South Arundel and Barbie Street, there is a high concentration of non-historic and vacant lots. A 1944 Sanborn map shows that this intersection once had several stores and small houses. So that's a gas station. This is a group of three stores, another group of um, three stores uh, within two buildings. 
that also has an S for a store. Uh, the rest appear to be dwellings or probably mostly shotgun dwellings looking at the um, footprints. You can see from this aerial that these stores and several of the houses have been lost and replaced by vacant lots and newer construction. And today, nothing from the 1944 Sanborn map remains. Here is a street level view of the same intersection today. The top view is from the intersection looking east down East Barbie Street, and the bottom view is from the intersection looking west down West Barbie Street. The last remaining area of older houses circled here in red is disconnected from the district by vacant land and newer buildings circled in, uh, sort of circled ish in green. To the east of the proposed district, shown in red, there is no concentration of contiguous historic resources east of North Arundel Avenue due to new commercial development, vacant lots, material changes to historic residences to, to accommodate commercial use. You can see here that the buildings on this side of the street are larger and more spread out, suggesting newer commercial uses, parking lots, and vacant lots. These photos help illustrate the vacant lots and new construction on the east side of the street. So you can, this one even still has the, the bulldozer out front. Because these changes, uh, let me back up one sec. Because of these changes to the streetscape, we could not extend the boundary farther to catch historic properties in the area farther to the northeast. Also in the area circled by the, by the blue circle, uh, which was historically African American, non historic construction is interspersed with the historic properties. So, unfortunately, we were not able to include it because there would be too many non contributing buildings in this area. And it's a little hard to tell, but these are quite a few um, trailers interspersed here uh, and here and here, uh, and just lots of, lots of changes in new construction in the area. In sum, the Zebulon Historic District retains the integrity to convey its local significance under Criterion A for commerce, community development and planning and education, as well as Criterion C for architecture with a period of significance spanning 1906 to 1971. And finally, I wanna go back to this map again uh, and close with a few facts about the district. Um, the idea of a National Register District in Zebulon has been considered since at least 2016, and the resulting boundary is not particularly different from the boundary that has been publicized for over five years. And to put the district size and period of significance in context with M. Wake County, here are a few statistics. Um, there are 19 National Register Historic Districts in Wake County outside of Raleigh, the average span of their periods of significance is 86, it's 68.5 years. So Zebulon's period of significance uh, is, is right there in that average. Uh, over half of those districts, 12 out of 19, use uh, what was the 50 year cutoff at the time of the nomination uh, as, as Zebulon's nomination does. Um, and Zebulon's nomination has the sort of added, it's not just the 50 year period, um, 50 year cutoff. Um, there is one building from 1971, and then there's a big jump of about six or seven years before there's any more construction in the district. Um, Zebulon's boundary contains 72 more resources than the next largest district in Wake County, which is Apex. So it is a large district for Wake County's uh, smaller towns, but within the state, it's, it's just an average size. We have um, districts with thousands of resources and districts with single digit um, numbers of resources. And finally, we have over 550 National Register Historic Districts in North Carolina, and those municipalities successfully use federal grant money to improve their communities um, all the time. So, uh, the staff recommends approval of the nomination, and um, we welcome any questions or discussion. Thank you, Jen and Sarah. Um, I imagine there are some questions and comments. I also want to remind any members of the public who may be um, listening in to the live stream that the chat room function in YouTube should be, uh, or the chat function, YouTube should be should be working and we can um, have those shared with the committee if there are comments or questions from members of the public. 
Well, Dr. Johnson here, I'd like to commend both Jen um, and Sarah for kind of waiting and walking us through this contested territory. Um, it, it is kind of interesting. I think that the thoroughness of y'all's work, though, um, is helping me. It answered some of the questions I had and the allegations that were made um, in reading through the commentary about the African American community. There seems to be a difference of perception of what was said and what wasn't said. But I think um, the perspective you brought, Sarah, just now helped me understand how it lines up in terms of the historic district. I mean, it, it is unfortunate that there, there isn't anything that's contiguous. And I think that in explaining in a, to the public, that is a, a key thing that has to happen. With the, the whole purpose is to have an impact district that interprets what happened historically. When you have gaps, it means you have to leap over something and try to figure it out. Um, I'm not sure what happened, who said what, um, but I do know that if there is a way for us to present as kind of neutral and not that we are, um, I think the allegation was that we were being very partisan. I mean, that the um, Sheepo office was being very partisan. And I do think that maybe that, that should be addressed. The presentation today was not partisan to me. It was as, as you've always done with the pre presenting district. It, it's been consistent. That, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And want to convey that consistency um, is very apparent. So I don't know that what was going on in that correspondence is hard to parse out what is and isn't true. I can only go by what was how it was presented today, which is in line with every other historic district that you all have brought to our attention. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Other comments, questions? I, I'd like to say that um, what's been presented seems to be comprehensive and you know, well-documented in terms of integrity and history. Um, whether art shouldn't be included because it's modern, I, I don't think that's borne out by what was been presented. If there's another area that wasn't included, I mean, that, that's an ongoing issue to continue to look at. You know, the staff can continue to look at you know, integrity issues or there's other concentrations that somehow can be pulled into a district. It's not contiguous to this one. You know, that's, again, an ongoing project. And I think we'd all agree there's long been, you know, sort of systemic issues with integrity and African-American neighborhoods and getting them to be eligible. So I know that's something that's a lot of people are thinking harder about if there's better ways to address that issue. So hopefully that can, you know, is not going to be ignored going forward. We'll continue to, you know, look at it if it can be presented to us. But, you know, what's been presented seems pretty clear and, you know, to me, our standards for um, recommendation. If we're taking motion, I'd make a recommendation to, you know, not to present it forward to the National Park Service. Is there a second or are there more comments or questions? I I, I have some questions, but but I saw that Dr. Brothers unmuted herself. I was just going to second, but if you have questions. Okay. Yeah, I just had a question about um, the the consideration of the, the African-American um, historic components that if there were, I, I, don't, I don't know if you can really answer this, but like if there were to be a survey that was focused on the African-American history in Zebulon, um, do you think that there is um, a, enough um, to potential, that there might be enough to potentially support a, um, a district that is focuses ex on the African-American history? Because I'm just thinking about how I know that with any district, um, issues of in integrity, um, it, 
as a, as a whole, right, sometimes we have more success, including components of an area under a district and whether or not like um, not in thinking about them now, not thinking about them now would harm any considerations in a like future survey. Does that make, does that make sense? Yes, yes. So um, Sherry Stradonsky and Heather Slane did a, did a really fine job with this nomination and really um, exhaustive. And New South Associates did the architectural survey back in 2018. And I'm going to turn it over to Beth in one second to speak to that. Um, but the, the 2018 survey casts a pretty big net. Um, and that's and that's why you end up with a study list district that was actually a little bit bigger than what came forward as National Register. So it's it's it sort of all feet. You have the survey that's looking at the bigger picture, and then you get a little tighter as to what you think might be eligible. And then the nomination itself really refines um, what you can list. Um, Sherry and Heather, and I, this is where Beth can really chime in for sure, seem to think that um, that there might be a district around uh, Shepherd Street School, but the the problem is is that none of none of the historically African American areas are very connected um, because of more modern development that's happened. Um, but Beth, if you want to speak more in depth of the overall survey work that's happened in Zebulon. Sure. So um, many of you who've been on the committee for a number of years will remember that the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission came to us for several years in a row during the early and mid 2000 teens. And we're, we're doing a phased approach to resurveying the comprehensive circa 1990 survey of Wake County outside of, of Raleigh. And so um, the 2016-2017 phase was uh, Zebulon, the municipal corporate limits of Zebulon, and its extraterritorial jurisdiction. And I think just a few things that would be in the vicinity, <clears throat> excuse me, people would, who have Zebulon addresses, but are um, just outside the town boundaries. <clears throat> When we study listed the um, potential National Register District, what you're considering today, uh, we also study uh, listed <clears throat> the concentration of buildings um, that's just slightly north of what historically was called Zebulon, that area around the railroad tracks from which the, the town grew over the 20th century. Um, we study listed a collection of buildings um, that are of uh, great importance to the African American community. And that includes a church, a missionary Baptist church, and a cemetery connected to the church, and also a, I believe, a Masonic lodge. And I apologize if it's if Masonic is not correct. It is a fraternal lodge. Um, and it is in our survey records, the correct identification for that. So we do have a potential um, study listed concentration that is more in historically what was thought of as the Wakefield community, which predates uh, Zebulon. Um, but it is, I believe, in town boundaries, and if not inside boundaries, that is in the ETJ of Zebulon. Um, in addition to that, we did resurvey the former Rosenwald School that's there on Shepherd School Road, named for that school. Um, that school is currently, I believe it has been turned into a residence and it is not a school that's easy to identify from the street as a Rosenwald school. It doesn't retain that appearance, but we did update our, our records for that building. Um, and then certainly we could uh, take a closer look at, at any resources in Zebulon and consider them you know, specifically in an African-American history context. Um, but I did want to point out that the, the survey was much larger than the National Register District. And so we have a few areas identified that we could certainly uh, return to and, and do some follow-up work in. Yeah, that, that's great. That's really helpful. Um, and I think important for us to sort of have on the, on the record that um, however the, the state the town preservation Zebulon might be able to support some kind of 
um, further exploration of African American cultural resources in the area um, would would be great, right? Would be really important. I was curious also about whether or not um, in the public meetings um, there were uh, members of the African American community who had expressed concern because I didn't see that in the letters that we received, right? The the primarily, um, particularly in the most recent. Um, Co correspondence, there were letters, many letters of support, right, from community members, and I think that's really important for us to acknowledge, too, um, but were there members of the um, African American community who expressed concerns in some of the public meetings? There, I attended a public meeting in person in uh, early May, and there were two two African-American gentlemen from, um, I'm not exactly sure from what neighborhood or exactly where they lived in Zebulon, but who, who did ask questions along the lines of why isn't, why doesn't the district include uh, black neighborhoods, uh, which of course is a reasonable, um, a reasonable question. And, you know, I addressed it the same way we're addressing it with you all today, that, that kind of explaining the way the National Register focuses on integrity and when you have gaps of new construction that can't be left over, um, you end up with, um, that's how you get communities and towns that have multiple historic districts. I mean, a lot of towns have more than one um, historic district. And so um, that, se that seemed to, um, you know, I mean, that is the answer. It's sort of the only answer I can give. <laughs> and that, um, that seemed to, uh, be um, an explanation that everyone at the meeting understood. There was one town uh, councilor or a town commissioner, I'm not sure what title they use, um, who also uh, asked a lot of questions about African American inclusion um, and uh, addressed the same, the same types of questions with her. Um, the National Register, like uh, Mr. Bergstone was saying, the National Register has um, you know, has a focus on integrity that sometimes makes it difficult to um, address African American neighborhoods or lower income neighborhoods of, of any background. Um, and it's something that we all recognize and are trying to do, do a better job at working with. And I think it's a national conversation, but right now the standards we have are the standards we have. Right. Yeah. And I would just like to add to that, that it is pointing out a larger structural issue that I think maybe we could take the lead in calling national convening to talk about, this is what happens with the wealth gap. When you have a racial dis, um, disparities, um, especially economically, that the vulnerable, these areas that we want to keep or want to preserve are very vulnerable because they are often low wealth or they're in neighborhoods where it's been redlined. And we're looking at the consequences of policies that were discriminatory. So part of that is to include, I think, um, and to encourage the preservation community to reach out to groups like the NAACP, like the church, the church or mosque people who are part of the community to find out what is, what do you understand as an impact historic community based on your particular group? Because I think this is going forward. I'm imagining also, or seeing that down the line, we're gonna be dealing with Latinx communities that have historic value. Um, we haven't even touched on Native American communities, right. what that looks like and how they interpret place. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is part of the way I think I would address some of those contentious issues that were raised in all that letters and going back and forth. I think that the folks are having an argument among themselves in Zebulon. I think what we were presented was a very reasonable um, construction of a historic district. And we also, to address um, what you're saying, Dr. McGill, that we need to think if we expand it, are we being as inclusive as possible? 
-hmm. in what we're doing, you know, especially when we have as a as the NRAC gone back and seen districts that were proposed where there wasn't an integrity problem. They just excluded out the African American community. Right. Yeah. Here there seems to be these gaps. And so um I think that's the way to kind of talk about it in a way that is more equitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think um I, I fully support everything <laughs> you just said, Dr. Johnson, to add to that too, to consider also the, the ways in which um, reaching out can sort of diversify um, the voices that express either concern about historic preservation or support for historic preservation too, because it's quite telling that, you know, there are all these letters of support, but then only maybe not everybody knows like how this process works, right? And I think, I mean, I want to recognize that the, the state has done due diligence in, in um, engaging and, and following the, the um, expectations for public meetings and all of that. And I'm glad to see the number that the 80 something people showed up at the last meeting and, and things like that. But um, But those are also places where I think we can sort of go on the record and say, you know, more needs to be done and sort of the ways we reach out and engage. So um, I did have a, um, a question in um, collaboration with Dr. Johnson's um, remarks. I know when one of the last few times that we met in person, we talked about these um, convenings and specifically um, collaborating with HBCUs. How and, and when can we begin that active movement towards that? Because I think and from what I'm hearing and what we know about um, the frustration from the community is not having that education beforehand and before gentrification takes place. Right. We have, so currently we have, um, and this is not exactly addressing what you're getting at, but we have a National Park Service grant to document um, civil rights resources in Northeastern North Carolina. Uh, that's going to be a primarily, uh, this at first, primarily an oral history focused um, research project, but eventually we are anticipating that that will result in some National Register nominations. Um, and we are also planning to um, put together another grant application uh, which we would submit toward the end of this year for a project to do uh, an MPDF, a multiple properties documentation form for um, green book uh, resources. So those are our sort of two really comprehensive uh, efforts at the moment to increase our African-American representation on the National Register. Um, but also we have, you know, even just looking at today's agenda, um, we have a number of African American resources, and I think, at least anecdotally, I think we've been seeing a steady increase in the number of resources we're listing. But in terms of the education, um, it's it does, it's always a challenge to reach any any community and um, in, during the process um, and get people to, you know, get people to listen to um, to a process that is a little bit bureaucratic or you know, kind of maybe not something everybody's naturally interested in. <laughs> so, and, and I'd worth, also, I was going to say it's worth the the effort. Um, yeah. I, I I am wholeheartedly concurring with um, Dr. Brothers. There are ways in which that can happen, and convening that you can pull together folks to engage in this needed educational process. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I also, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'll commit myself to Cumberland County because I know there's an interest there specifically because the gentrification is, is starting. Yes. It's starting. I'd also like to give, give you a teaser for something I was going to report during our, our October meeting because we will have had more um, opportunity to build the momentum. But the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, I'm currently the board president. At my request, we have convened a working group amongst the profession to address just the issues that Dr. Johnson, Dr. Brothers, and Dr. McGill have brought up, including access to the National Register, the questions of integrity, um, and just in general, 
Um, are there other methods um, in addition to the National Register to recognize important historic places uh, in our country that we're currently not using, but perhaps some, um, some other nations have, have adopted and have been successfully using to get both protection and recognition for historic places. So um, we're hopeful to have a report out early next spring. So that's a teaser for something I'll hopefully have more to tell you about come October. That's and that Thanks. includes approximately 25 states that are, are, are participating in that right now. If I can um, also add to Dr. Brothers' good um, question and comments, um, I think, I think, like she said, we have more digging in to do specifically with forming some strategies, how to get um, into and present to historically black colleges and how um, educating um, folks on National Register or getting people to participate in the process or how students could be engaged you know, throughout the state um, is, is something that we need to keep focusing on. Um, in general, as far as, you know, we've talked about in meetings, you know, contacts um, for nominations and how the group, um, we, um, you all been focusing as we get nominations, um, generally they're coming from constituents to us, but um, if a consultant's hired, making sure that they're not just reading, you know, doing book research and things and reporting outside of the community, but that they've, they've reached out to a, a local contact, they've had a lot of community meetings, um, whether it be, you know, church members, um, you know, neighborhood um, community leaders, um, folks who are connected to universities, um, you know, they need to find their context, they need to sit down and do, do oral history. Um, we have, for example, the consultants that um, wrote the Zebulon nomination um, have been engaged in writing many Rosenwald School nominations and other things where they um, have a practice of having a committee of people who are, you know, supporting the nomination and who have relatives who attended school or the church who um, do review the nomination, um, provide um, oral history interviews um, for the nomination, and who kind of edit before it comes to us to make sure that um, it is their perspective and voice coming through in the nomination and not just some um, random hired person looking at secondary sources. Um, and we we all, I think, agree that we need to dig deep always um, and find ways to do better um, moving forward. Dr. McGill, there's a question that has come up in the chat that we might want to have Julie Smith or Jen Bros address. I think all that correspondence is available online as well, but would you mind reading yes. that question? Yes, thank you. I was going to. Um, so there was a question that came up through the YouTube. Um, do the letters of support represent the residents of Zebulon? Julie, I think you had some good statistics uh, in an email yesterday uh, about where where people were writing from. Um, yes, as far as the letters of support that we got, there were um, 27 owners within the district that supported um, the nomination, and there were additional 43 letters of support of residents in, in Zebulon, or at least supported the district in Zebulon. Um, and then also possibly 40 additional letters that were delivered to the town that we didn't receive. I'm, I'm not sure if there's any overlap of that, but potentially, you know, 100 letters or so. Of, of support from the community. And, and Julie, where did those come from? I know some, you were saying that 20, 20 some were from owners in the district, but then yes, that's correct. were either from people who live in Zebulon, but we don't really know where, or, or, and or they don't, we definitely know they don't live inside the district. Is that? Um, yeah, some might just not had noted that they were inside the district, so we can't technically count them as being owners in the district, whereas others said, yes, here's my address, and we are in the district. Um, there was only one notarized ob objection that was um, prior to the February meeting, and it was, um, it was just not really an objection to the whole nomination, but, but to, for it to be tabled, which is, which is what happened, and we haven't received any other um, objections to it, only letters of support. And they were, they came in emails um, as well as just uh, physical mail. 
and those have all been scanned and were um, in the correspondence that you can see. And so my, in my experience, and some of the committee members have a lot more experience and definitely some of my colleagues have more experience, um, but in, in my experience, we generally only have maybe a letter of support from a town saying, you know, we're in favor of this district. And then that's about it. We generally don't get a lot of correspondence in, in either direction, in favor or in opposition to district. So this is a, I would say this has a really um, good public engagement and a lot of feedback from the public. And, and Dr. McGill, if I can also add, I am sending a note directly to Matt Zare, so it's not in the, in the meeting for everyone else. There is, as you all know, a, a, a web link to all of the correspondence received and all of the materials for all of the agenda items today. I'm going to ask Matt to add that to the YouTube chat and all of the correspondence that Julie Smith and others have referred to should be there. At least whatever we received, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, before close of business yesterday, is that correct? That's correct. As of um, the last mail that we received yesterday, everything was on there. Thank you. And emails. So I would ask kindly ask Matt to post that for the public's um, yeah. perusal. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to add real quick, um, kind of going back a little bit, um, my, my voice of support to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Brothers and Dr. McGill. Um, and also kind of emphasize something that Jen said about, you know, this this, the National Register Advisory Commission, our, our federal mandate from the, um, the legislation that enables us is, is to review, right? It's, it's in the name. We are reactionary in a lot of ways, but a lot of us have other roles where I think we can really push. And I think um, beyond these initiatives that folks have talked about um, with reaching out to historically Black communities and HBCUs and, and training folks and, and doing that education, super important. I think in addition, it's also important um, as, as Jen mentioned to, um, to continue that education to, to everyone, right? Not just historically marginalized communities because um, these things come to us from local preservation organizations, right? Um, and there's a reason that they choose to put forth this district first and, and not this one, right? Um, it seems like there's good case for some other, one, possibly two other historic districts um, in this specific area in the town of Zebulon. And I think that's pretty frequently the case, right? Um, so it's also about where, where towns and groups decide to put their resources and the voices that they have on their local preservation councils. And I think that that is, um, there's some further kind of public education that we can do along those lines, which are equally, equally important. So I just wanted to throw that out there for the record. Dr. McGill, may I add one other item that might be of interest to the group to Dr. Dethridge's um, point and others as well. And I believe Dr. Johnson's aware of this. Um, Angela Thorpe, who's the executive director of the African American, the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission, kindly prepared a video for us at our invitation, our office's invitation for certified local government training to help our local governments around the state. We have around 52 certified local governments and over 100 preservation commissions. About half of those are certified local governments, about half are not, um, to help them know about the services and the, the cooperation we have with the African American Heritage Commission. Um, to talk about those, those resources, those, those historic places, and to start helping people think about that. Um, Sarah Woodard and uh, Dan Becker, who's also working in our office, formerly with the city of Raleigh, also uh, prepared for our certified local government training last summer, um, which has been viewed many, many times, hundreds of views on YouTube um, uh, through our North Carolina Natural Cultural Resources channel um, about comprehensive preservation. In other words, making sure that you're looking in all parts of a jurisdiction and looking for the, the, the full inclusive story of a community. So we're, we're starting to continue, we're, we're continuing that effort. Um, Angela has, has been talking with Christy Brantley, uh, who's our local government coordinator about other ways that we can do additional outreach through those local governments um, who are our preservation partners. And I would add to that, um, that what is necessary is accountability. And so viewing things on YouTube 
Um, that's one mechanism. However, it does not provide accountability to community and to community folks because you're really just viewing it for your own edification. And so it could, I mean, lessons can be learned. I get that. But I really do know that face-to-face, -face, once we get there, Yes. In person, because you can hold folks. You can look them in the eye. We know how this kind of work best happens when you are going to be responsive to someone who actually represents whatever those communities are. Because I can see having a workshop with consultants because they may know the deep dive into the architecture and into the the um into that more academic formal way. But do they get it about community and about the networking and how you find out the information through looking at relationships rather than just looking at the structures and what they meant in a place? So I think there is and where you can get that information, because it's going to be in ways that are unexpected and that are not taught in our in many, many, many of our higher educational systems. Um, because you have this lack of a diverse faculty who will bring those perspectives. And so that's what, that's why um, Dr. Holmes Brothers is saying, y'all take responsibility for Cumberland. And I can say, I take responsibility for weight gravel, the whole, uh, the Warren in there, Lord Jesus. But, you know, the, um, the ways in which we can amplify, help amplify those voices and hold folks accountable for the decisions that they're making. Thank you for that. Um, I, I do want to bring up, I think we've had really um, rich conversation about uh, the concerns about um, the African-American cultural resources in Zebulon. Uh, but I, I also want to note, um, because we were talking about all of the, the letters of, of support, that there is a comment um, that came through um, that uh, from Zebulon Planning that there were notarized letters of opposition submitted by the town of Zebulon and Wake County Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and so I don't know if um, perhaps Jen wants to speak to that or if there's anyone else that sort of from staff that. Hey, thanks, Alicia. Um, yeah, I can, I see that comment now that Matt pulled over from YouTube. Um, yes, the notarized letters of um, opposition are submitted by the town of Zebulon on the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission um, attached um, for you all to, um, to read through. And um, as far as um, owners um, and nominating properties, the federal regulations say uh, property can't be nominated against the opposition of private property owner or majority of private property owners um, in the case of a district. Thank you. I mean, I, th I think it, Sarah, I saw that you unmuted yourself. I, you know, I was just gonna clarify that the what Jen is saying that the notarized objections can affect the direction of a nomination coming from, from private property owners, but not from the, not from a public entity like the county or the town. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think it is important, I, though I know this is also public, like all of those letters were already public record and now have been shared in the YouTube channel, that it is important to recognize that there, there were those oppositions. Um, and I think the only other comment that I have about um, all of this discussion is the concerns about process. And I really appreciated the background that Jen provided us um, about what was done and why there were changes. But I think that this is a, you know, very important, obviously, for SHPO going forward to think about this may become an issue in, in other considerations in the future too, right? And I know you're all aware of that, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that in the, in the meeting as, as well. Um, when things change 
from how they have been done, always been done before. And, and also whether or not there are sort of things that can happen or be done differently from what MPS mandates and what is still possible in terms of the con overall conversation. Can I ask a question too? I mean, the, the objections were about process and asking for delay for more comments. Um, but I don't see anything as any further you know, comments since that point that have any factual issues or you know, problems with, with, the, with the nomination. I mean, all, it seems like it's more a question about process and asking for some more time to do that. And we've allowed that. And yet I don't see anything that would, you know, cause us to reconsider anything that's been proposed in the nomination. Is that true? Is there anything that they said that had more, you know, factual issues with the, the nomination? I think it was also at what point, um, wh whether and when they were invited to comment and at what at what point, right? <clears throat> um, but no, I I think that your point is, is well made, uh, David, that it's not, it does not in any way affect our ability to consider the very thorough uh, nomination. Are there any other comments or questions either from the committee members or the public or staff? I have another one, just looking back, um, you know, I'm, I wanna thank uh, David for his question in, in the clarifying if there was kind of anything other than the processual. And what I see in those two letters, in addition to that is um, that, um, that, it, that comment that the district is at once too large and too small to tell the full story of the town of Zebulon. And I think, and maybe that's, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase it here, but I think when looking at um, the areas of significance and the levels of significance that are presented by um, the nomination. I, I don't think that that is um, fully any single nomination's goal. And I, and I wonder if maybe in some of the communication that's something that um, perhaps got overlooked. I'm sure it was said um, by, our, um, by our very competent um, and just hardworking staff um, and these consultants. Um, but I also just kind of want to emphasize that, that if, if this proceeds over um, objections of the town and if um, at the federal level it continues to proceed, that that does not mean that either the state or the federal government views this as the full story of, of the town of, of Zebulon, even, even the full story of its um, railroad and tobacco and, and textile industries. Um, I just wanna emphasize that, at least me, as, a, as someone who has served on this committee for a while, I always want to see more. Right, I wanna see us telling more stories and broader stories and everything that we add to the register adds to the story. Um, so I would hope that should things proceed um, that folks don't see this as um, some sort of comment on the, on the full history of, of the town. This is, this is just a part um, and we would hope as reflected in the survey and further recommendations from um, accepting the survey and adding things on the study list that we would see more in the future, that this body would see more. Um, but I, I think that those were the two main objections was about process um, and about story. That's not how the letters phrased it. So that's, that's my interpretation. Um, I wanna make that clear too. Um, but I did just wanna make sure that we really kind of looked at that. And I think that the presentation from staff covered those things really clearly as, as Dr. McGill said. Um, but I don't know if other folks have other questions or things, because I do want to make sure that we are um, not just following the letter of the process, right? But that we are fully engaging with, with these things. Yeah, and I think, I think you can see from the timeline that we've had um, quite a bit of engagement over years now with, with the town of Zebulon. And then sort of to, to your point about 
storytelling, you know, the, Na the National Register is inherently somewhat limited by focusing on what's still standing. And, you know, and you can get into archaeological um, components, of course, but in general, um, most of our nominations focus on things that are still standing. And that does often leave out quite a bit of history um, that's not representative, not represented anymore uh, in, in the architectural record that's still, that's still above ground. Um, and uh, the other, um, there was one more point that Dr. Baldwin Deathridge made, and it's, I didn't write it down, and it slipped right out of my mind. But um, uh, yeah, so I guess my, my main points are that you can see from the timeline that we have had a lot of interaction, um, you know, and, and you all can see it's a really well done, well done nomination. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? I want to commend the committee and staff and our members of the public for um, having a, a rich conversation about all of this, an important conversation. And I feel like actually our last several meetings, we, we have had some uh, deep conversation that I, I appreciate us sort of putting this on the these kinds of things on the record and also thinking towards the future about our roles and how we review and advise and engage. Um, and uh, I think that's all I wanted to say there that, um, oh, especially right before lunch, <laughs> right? <laughs> that we um, did not just sort of rush through this, this conversation. So um, I know that David Bergstone had um, moved to approve the um, staff recommendations for this, um, very thorough uh, uh, district. And I, th I think that we had an almost second. Um, so is, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bryan. Um, so we will move to a vote about the Zebulon Historic District. Um, and going through our Hollywood squares, I'm next and I, I vote yes on, on the district. Uh, Dr. Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Matt Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Denard. You're muted. Unmute myself and I vote yes. Thank you. Uh, Terry Russ. Yes. Uh, Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Baldwin Deathridge. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, oh, Dr. Johnson, you're down there on the on the bottom here. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so that does pass. I do want to note um, that there was a, a comment that came in as we were taking our vote that the early meeting in May was the first community meeting held on on this subject. Um, I, I I don't know. That doesn't seem to be the case. Um, uh, based on the, the records that we've been provided, but um, but I appreciate that additional uh, comment. Um, okay, I think it's time for lunch. <laughs> uh, is there any any other order of business that we need to do before I sort of ha have us take lunch? No. Okay. Um, so it is one twenty three. Uh, so let's take, let's, let's take lunch until two o'clock. We usually take about a, a half hour lunch. Um, this was, has been a long morning. Um, and so let's reconvene at two o'clock. Um, and thank you to everybody. Um, and, um, Fred and, and Dr. Brothers, if you could stay on for just a sec. Um, and yeah, I saw that you have a, a three o'clock meeting. So um, if you can stay in the meeting, go ahead and do that. If not, um, just rejoin us and I'll check and make sure we have quorum when we come back. Have a good lunch, everybody.
team members. I see Annie is with us. Um, and we have two um, presentations from Annie. So um, I'm gonna call the meeting back to order. Matt, you can make us uh, live. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, Annie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I am presenting two National Register nominations from the Western Region today, as I believe you said, Dr. McGill. Um, so the first is for the South Asheville Cemetery and St. John Baptist Church, which are located in central Buncombe County to the southeast of downtown Asheville and on the east slope of Bowcatcher Mountain. Here you can see the property relative to the other National Register listed resources in Asheville. The South Asheville Cemetery originated as a burial ground for Africans and African Americans enslaved by the Smith and McDowell families, whose circa 1840 house, now a local history museum, sits on a hill roughly one and a quarter miles to the southwest. There is very little early documentation of the cemetery, but it is believed to date to the mid 1800s when William and Sarah McDowell set aside this land on their expansive property. The first written record of the cemetery dates to 1890 when it is referenced in a deed. George Avery, who was born into slavery in Marion, McDowell County was a blacksmith enslaved by the McDowells. According to family tradition, Avery gained emancipation near the end of the Civil War when William McDowell encouraged him to enlist with the Union Army in order to receive a post-war pension. After his discharge in 1866, Avery returned to live in Asheville and the McDowells provided him with land, lumber to construct a house, and his job as caretaker of the South Asheville Cemetery. William McDowell died in the late 19th century, followed by Sarah in 1905. Shortly thereafter, the nearby Baptist and AME Zion churches created a cemetery board to oversee management of the burial ground, although Avery continued to be its caretaker until his death in 1938, digging graves and collecting burial fees that went to the two churches. The South Asheville Cemetery lies at the heart of an historically African-American settlement north of Kenilworth, a residential neighborhood developed by James Madison Childs during the first quarter of the 20th century. It occupies a 1.74 acre parcel bounded by a non-historic fence installed within the past 10 years. Though a comprehensive mapping effort by the archeology span program at Warren Wilson College recorded 1,961 interments, less than 10% of the graves have visible markers. This is likely due to a number of factors, including the ephemeral nature of some markers like those of wood, damage to markers over the past 150 years, and in some cases, the lack of installed markers at the time of burial. Longtime South Asheville resident George Gibson, who assisted Avery in his later years, recalled how families often remembered where their relatives' unmarked graves were by the location of trees, rocks, nearby graves and other landmarks. The South Asheville Cemetery contains a variety of grave markers and headstones reflecting African-American burial traditions from the 19th and early 20th centuries. The graves are typically oriented east to west so that the interred face the rising sun. The markers are typically traditional in form and appearance with the only two commercial granite markers being the last two grave markers installed in the cemetery. The relatively small number of visible markers include weathered wooden crosses, like those here, and stone tablets that display common iconography, such as Masonic emblems, clasped hands, foliot motifs, and lambs, the latter symbolic of a child's burial. A handful of hand-inscribed markers remain as well, with the exception of Harper's cross shaped headstone shown here, these simple markers are typically rectangular tablets placed directly in the ground. To the south of the cemetery lies the 1.1 acre parcel on which sits St. John Baptist Church. The congregation constructed its first house of worship 
a frame building in roughly the same location in 1914. A second frame church replaced the original when it burned in the late 1910s or early 1920s. The current edifice was constructed in 1929. The building has been modestly altered over the past 30 years. Most notably on the exterior, the original entrances in the towers were blocked for the installation of restrooms, while the central door on the gabled main block was added to consolidate and improve access. On the interior, the ceiling has been lowered and the floor carpeted, but many of the original features remain. To the southwest of the cemetery, shown here with a small circle, um, lies St. Mark's AME Zion Church. Though home to the second congregation that comprised the cemetery board, this building is not included in the nomination because of its distance from the other properties and because it has been converted to residential use, necessitating numerous additions and alterations that alter the building's historic character. The South Asheville Cemetery and St. John a Baptist Church are eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion A in the areas of African-American ethnic heritage, social history, settlement, and community planning and development. The property meets criteria considerations A and D. The boundary is drawn to encompass all of the marked and unmarked graves identified through the archeology span work done by Warren Wilson College as well as St. John a Baptist Church, which was important in the history of the property. The period of significance is circa 1850, when the cemetery is believed to have been founded, to 1943, when it ceased being used for interments. And would you like me to keep going, or do you want to stop and ask questions now? I think go ahead and give your second presentation, and then we'll do questions after that. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. The second and last nomination for the Western Region is the Robbinsville Downtown Historic District, located in central Graham County in the far southwestern region. Less than one square mile in area, the town of Robbinsville was founded in the early 1870s upon creation of Graham County in 1872. The commercial core grew organically through the late 19th century and is oriented along the north-south axis of Main Street, with commercial and institutional development extending down cross streets. Noted here in blue is the location of the 1942 Graham County Courthouse, which was individually listed in the National Register in 2007. Three other civic and institutional buildings and complexes are scattered throughout the district, including the former Graham County Jail, constructed circa 1910 to the northwest of the courthouse and shown here on the left, and the 1953 Bemis Memorial Library to the south of the courthouse, shown here to the bottom right. To the north of downtown is the sprawling Robbinsville School Complex. Though the WPA era classroom buildings are now gone, extant buildings from this period include the 1939 Band Building, the 1938 gymnasium, and the high school science building erected in 1950. The classroom buildings date from the mid to late 20th century. Most of the commercial buildings are concentrated in the blocks immediately surrounding the courthouse and the commercial resources include the circa 1927 Snyder department store and the sprawling Phillips Motel complex which was built in 1945 and expanded over the next 20 years. Both of these resources were individually study listed in February of 2018. The commercial buildings are mostly one or two stories tall and date primarily from the 1910s through the early 1960s. Most display traditional commercial building forms with parapets, fronting gable or shed profile roofs, and traditional storefronts with little to no ornament, like the circa 1930 Roy Millsap building here on Court Street, and this circa 1930 commercial building on North Main. Many of the buildings display stone veneered facades that were either added to existing frame buildings or integral to the original construction. The Blue Beacon Pole Hall is one such building whose circa 1930 grapevine mortared facade conceals the fact that this is actually a boxed frame commercial building that may date to the first quarter of the 20th century, 
with a circa 1950 edition that also features boxed frame construction. And as an aside, this is fairly significant. We see boxed frame dwellings out here in the West uh, across a multi-county area, um, but this is the first boxed frame commercial building that I've seen in the region. Immediately north of the Blue Beacon Pool Hall sat the Baker Building, which was lost to fire. Though the body of the structure is gone, the circa 1934 facade, the only two-story stone facade in Robbinsville, is counted as a contributing structure in the district. Mm -hmm. Another notable building in the district is the circa 1910 Graham County Bank slash Ingram's Drug Store, which sits opposite the courthouse and is one of the earliest commercial buildings in the district. Among the mid-century commercial buildings in Robbinsville are the circa 1960 Joyce Kilmer Restaurant and the circa 1951 Phillips and Jordan Machine Shop. The 20 non-contributing resources in the district include the circa 1900 Arthur Millsap store. Though this is also among the earliest commercial buildings in Robbinsville and is one of the few that represents the type of commercial resource constructed during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it's counted as a non-contributing property in the inventory due to alterations from the uh, late 1900s. But it's important to note that it retains its original storefront configuration and remedial work may be possible to render it contributing in the district at some point in the future. Other non-contributing resources include the circa 1955 Citizens Bank and Trust Company, which was substantially altered in the third quarter of the 20th century and the 1968 post office. A handful of dwellings are scattered throughout the district. The earliest of these is the circa 1872 Hope Phillips House, which is also the oldest extant resource in the district and all of Robbinsville. Mm -hmm. Most of the dwellings date from the 1930s through the 1960s, such as the circa 1940 Ingram House shown here, the circa 1949 Cooper House, and this site circa 1950 Parsonage, which lies just south of the circa 1938 Methodist Church, which is the only church within the district boundaries. The Robbinsville Downtown Historic District contains a total of 53 contributing resources and 20 non-contributing resources within boundaries that encompass approximately 38.6 acres and that were drawn to include the greatest concentration of historic contributing resources in the town. The historic district is eligible for listing in the National Register under criterion A in the areas of commerce, politics, government, and education, and under criterion C in the, architect in the area of architecture as a locally significant collection of commercial, institutional, and residential building forms and styles from the late 19th through the mid 20th centuries. The period of significance begins in 1870, circa 1872, the date of the Hoke Phillips House, and ends in 1965. And that concludes my presentation, and I'll entertain any questions. Should I close the presentation, or would you like for me to leave it open? I guess close it um, so that we can, I, I can see everybody, but if anybody asks you to pull it back up to see anything, then we can do that. Any questions? Thank you, Annie. Questions or comments or? Annie, I, I had a question. The, the, yes. The joints on those stones, are they a protruding beaded joint or, or you know, a real grapevine where it's a recess? Um, on, images. on some of them, some of the masonry in Robbinsville is done with a grapevine mortar joint. Some okay. of it is done with a, just a flush, like a, just a regular smooth mortared joint. Right. Um, it, it varies. It's not immediately clear if, for example, all of them were originally done with a grapevine joint and you know, that was then later changed through remortaring. Um, right. It's also not clear if they're, because we don't have all of the documentation about the masonry that was done in town in the 1930s. Um, there was, uh, so whether or not it started out grapevine and evolved over time, or if there were different masons doing different, um, doing different mortar work at the same time, it, it, that's not immediately clear. The research hasn't shown that. And were you specifically referring to the Blue Beacon Pole Hall 
because that yeah, does actually... look like there's a shadow, but it's it's actually a protruding. It's a bead joint, not a not a grapevine, which is a groove cut into it. Okay, then I, I will I will verify that, and um, we will correct the nomination if it's in error. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I just can tell from the pictures that it was interesting. Thank you. Other questions or comments? No. Oh. Hearing none or seeing none. Oh, Dr. Denard. I was about to move approval. All right, sounds good to me. Is there a second? I will second that, Matt Jorgensen. All right, thank you. And we will move through our roll call vote. Uh, Mary Lynn Bryan. Yes. Thank you. I vote yes. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Tamara Brothers. Yes. Thank you. David Bergstone. <coughs> yes. Valerie Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Terry Russ. Yes. Kristen Baldwin Detheridge. Yes. Yes. Is that I think that's everybody. All right. Then um, those two properties um, are approved unanimously. Thank you. Uh, and so now we're moving to the Eastern region and I think John is first and then Scott. All right, thank you, Alicia. Just as a forewarning, we have the fire suppression system folks here at the Eastern office. So if the fire alarm goes off, we're not really on fire that I know of. Often see that. Yes. All right. Our first property from the east is in Carteret County, and it's the Earl W. Webb Jr. Memorial Civic Center and Library, which is located in downtown Moorhead City. The building was constructed in 1930 by Earl Webb Sr. as rental office space housing a doctor's office and medical clinic on the first floor and various business offices and a training center for garment workers on the second floor. Earl Webb Sr. was born and raised in Moorhead City and studied law at several universities and became an attorney in New York in 1904. In 1922, he went to work as an attorney for General Motors and then became director of General Motors Chemical Company, which eventually became the Ethyl Gasoline Company where he was instrumental in shepherding the lead gasoline additive ethyl through government investigations into its public health and environmental impacts. Though his professional life kept Earl Webb Sr. and his family in New York City, he maintained a strong connection to Carteret County. He and his wife Ava purchased 200 acres of land overlooking Bogue Sound and built a vacation home there in the 1920s. Webb continued to develop real estate in Moorhead City, financing the Florentine Renaissance Revival style municipal building built in 1926 and constructing what is now the Earl W. Webb Memorial Civic Center and Library, which was built on the site of his childhood home. In December of 1932, Webb's son and namesake, Earl Wayne Webb Jr., then a student at Duke, died of pneumonia. His body was brought from his home in New York to be buried in the family plot in Moorhead City. In, the following, in March of the following year, Earl Webb Sr. established the Earl Wayne Webb Jr. Memorial Fund in memory of his son to provide educational, religious, and charitable causes. In 1934, the Moorhead City Women's Club started a town library that was housed in the upstairs room of the town hall and fire station. And when that library outgrew the space of the town hall, they were given a single second story room in Webb's building for the library. With their continued success, they pressed for additional space. In 1936, um, Webb made the decision to convert his building to a library and civic center to provide space for the public library and community meeting rooms and to serve as a memorial to his late son. Its grand opening occurred a year later in 1937. The two-story colonial revival style building features symmetrical elevations oriented around a central entrance each with a classically inspired surround with pilasters, raised panel jams, pediments, and fan lights. The exterior walls are laid in a variant of common bond and terminate at the eave, which are decorated with a medallion block corner. Gable dormers are present on all slopes of the hip roof. 
The interior of the building has a double loaded corridor running north south on the first and second floors with shorter intersecting east west halls aligned with a principal entrance and interior stair. The interior retains a high degree of integrity with the historic terrazzo and wood floors, doors, interior woodwork, plaster, and wood panel walls all remaining intact. Off of the quarters, rooms include reading rooms, stacks, meeting spaces, a circulation desk, workroom, kitchen, and bathroom. And I'll just take you on a tour of what some of those so you see that the doors in the hallway all have transoms over them. Uh, this is what the first floor corridor looks like. Uh, some of the first floor rooms, the top right is actually the children's library reading room. Uh, this is the, the stair between the first and second floor, which is centrally located in the building. Uh, some of the second floor corridor spaces and the upstairs rooms. It's actually a very cozy and inviting space when you're in there. The Earl W. Webb Jr. Memorial Civic Center Library is significant under Criterion C for architecture as a good example of a substantial colonial revival style public building in Moorhead City. It's significant at the local level with a period of significance from 1930 when it was built to 1937 when it was reconfigured to house the local library. As an interesting side note, the building is the site of numerous instances of paranormal activity and its haunting has been investigated on several occasions by researchers of the supernatural. So if there are no questions on the web library, I'll turn it over to Scott. Any questions or since they're being presented by um, two different people, we can take questions or comments now. None, okay. Then we will move on to the Enfield uh, presentation by uh, Scott, and then and then we can take a vote. Scott, you're on mute. You're still muted. Yeah, I just couldn't figure out how to get back to cut the mute button off. All right, let's start this over again. Must be time for me to retire when I can't figure out the technology. All right, can everybody see that and hear me? Yes. Okay, now we're ready to go. Okay, so this is the uh, town of Enfield Historic District and the town of Enfield, if, if you don't know, is located in South Central Halifax County. It's really just a few miles north of the Edgecombe County line. Uh, the Enfield Historic District includes the majority of mid 19th through mid 20th century resources illustrating the growth of the town as an agricultural trading and processing center centered on the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, <clears throat> uh, which was actually built through the community um, in eight and the county in 1840. The streets, as you can tell from here, are roughly arranged in a grid pattern and that's centered on those railroad tracks. So the big gray line up the middle is the railroad track. Come over about two blocks, and in some cases one block. You'll see Highway NC301. If you know anything about Eastern North Carolina, you know that that's a major north-south uh, route. Uh, so that, that's more the 20th century route and the railroad tracks, of course, go back to, again, the mid 19th century and beyond. It is still an active railroad uh, track. Uh, I just noticed when I put this together, you really can't see the boundaries. So if you'll kind of follow my cursor starting down here in the south, it, it, it kind of goes like this. Um, we're going up through and, and, and catching as much and pulling in as much of the historic remaining uh, properties as we can with, that have integrity. Uh, this whole grouping up here is where the industrial peanut 
facilities are, uh, which the town is known for, still known for their active peanut processing. Um, you're mm -hmm. coming down, we go all the way over a little bit beyond um, Highway 301, um, and then a little bit beyond here to pick up uh, a residential uh, early to mid 20th century neighborhood. And then it comes all the way back down um, to the bottom down here. So that's, that's sort of the way it, it looks. Uh, resources include a, a range of building types and styles, including residential resources dating from 1833 33 through about 1972. Commercial industrial resources that largely date from the early 20th century. The district is bounded on all sides by later construction, vacant lots, or buildings that have been significantly altered. Alterations to historic buildings are typically limited to the application, as is very typical in, in these kind of communities. Synthetic siding and or the installation of replacement windows, doors, and also for store storefronts in the commercial area. Only 13 primary resources within the district boundaries post date the period of significance. So a really high concentration of, of resources um, that are in the period of significance. Uh, so we're looking at uh, south at the railroad track with the depot. Um, we're now looking um, at some other commercial buildings um, downtown that face the, the railroad tr uh, track. Uh, commercial and industrial buildings date from the early 20th century and are largely vernacular in form and style. Commercial buildings are a brick construction with parapet roofs. Uh, this is the fantastic institutional building. It's the Masonic Lodge and is it, as well as it's maintained and intact on the exterior, the interior is just unbelievable. With a, uh, on the first floor with a movie theater and then on the upper floors, uh, with the Masonic Lodge that is no longer used for that purpose, but it's really very intact. Uh, most of these commercial buildings have minimal detailing, though several have uh, colonial revival, classical revival, or as in the case of this building, some Romanesque revival style elements. Um, and of course, every community has to have their uh, nod to modernism with this mid 20th century post office. Uh, the industrial buildings, which I showed you the area in the north where you see most of those, and most of those are peanut processing facilities, um, are typically framed. They have metal sheathing, and most of them have just simple gable uh, metal roofs on them. Uh, there is, I believe, a couple of really nice colonial revival style churches uh, to sort of present the institutional aspects um, of the town. Our residences within the district vary significantly in the size and the architectural style based on their date of construction and, of course, as is typically the case, whatever the owner's financial means were when the building was constructed. They include modest mid-19th century Greek Revival style houses, large two-story late 19th century Italianate and Queen Anne style houses. A lot of those have wide front porches on them. Sometimes they wrap around. Uh, sometimes they'll have uh, multiple rear wings on them. Uh, modest early 20th century vernacular, uh, colonial revival, and craftsman style houses. So you can see them everywhere from, you can see kind of the difference in the size of the buildings here in some mid 20th century buildings. Uh, craftsman bungalows. Again, craftsman bungalows and then some that are just basically simple um, two-story frame housing. And again, some mid 20th century Dutch colonial revival. So you get this smattering of, of sizes and houses. Just another shot of some mid 20th century and early 20th century bungalows. Uh, remnants of roadside tourist architecture, you know, most of that, of course, is associated with Highway 301, the automobile age, exists in, the, in this particular property, which was the Southland Court and Restaurant. Um, which was located on US 301. And if you'll look in this, and I'll show you a period postcard, you can see the remnants of this whole complex here with the restaurant being in that largest building to the left, which is a great little period photograph, the Southland Court. <clears throat> the infield historic district is significant at the local level and the Criterion A for Commerce is an important trading center for the southern portion of Halifax County. It's also significant under Criterion A for industry as an important processing center for farmers in the southern portion of Halifax County, and that continues today, particularly with peanut production. 
And finally, the historic district is significant um, also at the local level for criterion C for architecture. The infield historic district retains representative examples of commercial, residential, institutional, and industrial architecture constructed in the 19th and 20th centuries, illustrating both vernacular and high style buildings that demonstrate national stylistic trends during the period of significance. And that period of significance is 1833, which begins with the earliest surviving building and ends about 1972, circa 1972. And that includes really new construction um, that was just being completed at the Golden Peanut Company. It also reflects the decline in both new construction and updates to existing buildings really after that time. So not a lot done after that. Uh, and that concludes my final presentation to the National Register Advisory Committee. Any questions? Thank you, Scott. Any questions, comments? Uh, yes, I have a quick, a quick question for you. It may be a, a, a rather contrary question, but uh, what is the ethnic uh, makeup of this uh, historic district? In other words, I'm asking, is there an African-American owned property in this district? Oh, there will be African-American owned properties in the district. The predominant, and, and as you might know, um, Halifax County historically has had a large African-American population and the town of Enfield has a large African-American population and, and quite a number of the African-American population live within this district not necessarily in properties that were constructed for them, but primarily in properties that have transitioned over the last 50 to 75 years to African American either ownership or as rental property. Uh, there is a traditional African American neighborhood. Um, it had a school which has been demolished. It had some um, agricultural slash industrial buildings which have been demolished. And a lot of the housing has been demolished there. Um, I think there is a portion of it that's included in this district, but not a huge portion of it because there were issues with integrity for it. Um, because I, I don't really know what the population is, um, African-American versus a white population, but I assume it's close to 50, 50 or it could even be 60, 40 uh, African-American to white. So it's a large African-American population in this town. But, uh, but 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 what we are uh, saying in essence, and I guess what I'm driving at is that though is there is no visual uh, a representation of uh, of an African American community uh, in this uh, historic district. Not in, in not a totally intact neighborhood specifically associated with African American ownership from the beginning when it was constructed. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Is there a motion to... Terry, I saw that you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I know. I'd like to make a motion to approve these properties. Great, thank you. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. <laughs> I don't know who I caught first. Uh, Dr. Brothers, second. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll mo move into our, our roll call vote. Dr. Bryan. Yes. Thank you. I vote yes. Dr. Denard. I vote yes. Thank you. Matt Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. David Bergstone. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Yes. And Dr. Baldwin Dethridge. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I was originally gonna have us take a break before or after these, but they went faster than, than I thought they would. But I think this is a good time for um, Dr. Brothers, if you want to sign off, because I know that you have a, a three o'clock um, and, uh, and, and Fred, are you going to have to leave us or? I can stick around till about maybe 3.15 at the latest. So if that works, I'm happy to stay. I don't know, um, Sarah, how long do you think you're? I, 
<clears throat> sorry if I can get myself unmuted. Um, I have two five minute presentations and one that's going to go a little closer to 10 minutes. So um, in the 15 to 20 minute range total. So that would probably be okay. And then we could take our, take our, our break. Um, and uh, Matt Jorgensen, I know that you're going to have to, to step out, but um, if you, if you do, that's fine. And um, like, if you're not able to reconnect, we're fine with quorum um, and you can just vote uh, based on what you hear. Does that sound? Sorry, I was unmuting myself and switching over to the phone. So if you can hear me, I will be able to participate. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, then I think we'll move to have Sarah's presentations. And then when, after those, then we will take a, a probably a short break, maybe. I don't know. Okay. I guess kind of depends on how the last two, or we may just keep on going through. So, <laughs> um, and I think it go on. Keep on going. I don't think we should take a break. Okay. All right. All right. Um, are you all seeing my um, presentation? Or are you seeing the part with the one with the notes? We're seeing the one with the notes. Okay. There we go. Okay. So my, my first resource is the Logan neighborhood, which is in Concord in Cabarrus County. And there we go. Uh, just to locate Cabarrus County for you. And then um, the town's existing uh, National Register and study listed districts are shown in blue and green here. And they are focused on North and South Union Street and the traditionally white residential, commercial, and manufacturing areas of the town of Concord. The Logan neighborhood is located directly south of the middle of Concord and immediately southwest of the South Union Street Historic District. Indeed, parcels in the South Union Street Historic District boundary expansion, which was added to the study list in 2002, will be reevaluated in the National Register process to determine if they should be in the South Union Street District or the Logan District. And I'm talking about this uh, small green area right here. Logan takes its name from the Reverend Frank Thomas Logan, an African-American pastor and educator who was born into slavery in Greensboro in 1859. He came to Concord around 1891 to found the Concord Colored School where he served as a principal for 40 years. He also served as the chaplain at Scotia Seminary for Colored Women, which is now Barber Scotia College, located about one block north of this neighborhood. His house stood near the campus, but it's been torn down, and so it's not included uh, in the proposed district. These two maps show the potential district boundary, and I'm sorry, it's um, difficult to see. It's outlined in red. Um, <clears throat> the map on the left points out a few landmarks, and the map on the right is colored to highlight the various platted neighborhoods within the district. While the area is considered a single neighborhood and is commonly known as Logan, it was platted between 1904 and 1946 into at least 13 subdivisions. The earliest was called Colburg, developed by a formerly enslaved man named Warren Clay Coleman. Coleman bought his land from his former owner in the 1870s, but he didn't subdivide it until 1904. Colburg is where the neighborhood's oldest homes stand. The other flats were developed by white businessmen and property owners, uh, but were marketed specifically for black ownership. Logan features a diverse collection of houses from the early 1900s through the 1970s. The research necessary for a National Register nomination will reveal when the period of significance uh, should most logically end. Resources include multiple churches, and Concord's three earliest public housing complexes, and commercial office and institutional buildings. The top left building is the gym from the Logan High School. This building dates to the 1950s, but the school itself originated with the Concord Colored School that Reverend Logan had founded. <laughs> Logan's residents included black citizens from working class and professional backgrounds and served as a social and commercial hub for black life in Concord. 
The Logan neighborhood is a large district encompassing 369 acres with approximately 800 buildings. The district retains good overall architectural integrity and is recommended for study listing under criterion A in the areas of community planning and development and ethnic heritage and criterion C in the area of architecture is an intact collection of residential, religious, and commercial architecture from the early 1900s into the 1970s. The district was brought forward for study listing by the city of Concord following their development of a historic preservation plan. That planning process and the city's decision to follow through with the study list application for Logan has been greeted with enthusiasm with the Logan neighborhood and the city and the planning consultant who drafted the preservation plan have been in close contact with the neighborhood and there appears to be good support and excitement about a future nomination. Staff recommends approval of the Logan neighborhood study list application. And I will keep zipping right along to my next resource, which is Woodlawn Manufacturing Company. Uh, this, was this building was completed in 1907. It's the third electrically powered textile mill in Gaston County. C.E. Hutchinson was one of the primary organizers and he was very active in textile manufacturing in Mount Holly. Stuart Kramer, who was a renowned mill engineer, was the plant's engineer. Like many textile concerns, the factory passed through several, several ownership phases and its windows were bricked in as part of modernization efforts. It's unclear exactly when manufacturing ceased here, but it was being used for textile manufacturing at least into the mid 20th century. Woodlawn is located in Gaston County in the town of Mount Holly. You can see it up here. Um, this is the core of downtown Mount Holly. Uh, Woodlawn is off to the north. And this is a modern aerial photograph of the site, which I've turned sideways just so I could make it a little bit uh, bigger. Like most mills, it's had several additions. The original, uh, the 1907 mill and the transformer house, which is the little building right here, are highlighted in blue. In 1937, a warping and winding room was added here and then bathrooms were added here. During the 1940s, a narrow cotton waste room was added and a twisting room was added at this uh, jaunty little angle. In the 1950s, additions included an office to the front and a cotton warehouse uh, that's a freestanding building. Then in the 1960s and into the 1970s, um, a shipping room was added here, a mechanical room or a machine shop was added here, and then a mechanical room for some air conditioning equipment was added on the back. The 1970s machine shop and half of the 1950s warehouse have been demolished because they've been neglected beyond repair. And just to clarify for my um, colleagues in the office, uh, when I presented this at staff review, I thought the entire warehouse had been demolished, but in fact, only half has been torn down. So now we're gonna take a little tour and, and just go right around the building. And we'll begin at the front. So this is the 1907 mill. This is uh, part of the 1937 bathroom additions. Again, the front, it's got some nice details that are hard to see because the brick has been painted. Uh, this is the, would be the north end of the original mill and then uh, the 40s um, cotton waste room. And this is looking to the next edition for the to the cotton waste room and the mechanical room that was torn down was right in here and then this is that 1950s warehouse is partially demolished so we're just moving along around the front this is the 1907 transformer house or transformer mm -hmm. building the 50s uh, cotton warehouse partially collapsed <clears throat> Then this part of the 50s warehouse is still intact and the owner plans to retain it. So now we're moving around the end of that. Around the back, this is the back of the transformer house. And then along the back of the mill, <clears throat> and I don't know the dates on when some of these um, mechanical uh, things and air conditioning units and such were added to the roof. This is the 1940s edition that comes off at an angle. 
I'm just moving around. This is the 1960s um, uh, shipping room. And then we're moving back to the front. So this is, uh, this is the end from the 1960s, I think it was. This is 1937. You can see a brick color change here. And then a 1950s office. That's the 1950s mm. office. The 37 bathrooms on the front. And back to the front. Um, inside, I'm sorry for the grainy photographs. Um, the mill retains its open, um, open manufacturing space. The columns are steel columns and they were originally wood. Uh, and the floor, the original floor remains. This is in the main mill. This is in the twisting room uh, from the 1940s. And then uh, this is the shipping room from the 1960s. And back to the front. So staff recommends the Woodlawn Manufacturing Company for the study list under Criterion A for its association with industry and in Mount Holly. And carrying on to City Motor Company. Um, City Motor Company is located in Salisbury, which is in Rowan County. And it's just about downtown. This is the Rowan County Courthouse. And so we're right down here just a few blocks away. City Motor was completed in 1946 and is a very intact car sales and repair complex. This photo from 1946 shows the components that remain in place today. There's a corrugated parapet. Um, pretty much all these windows are um, metal casement windows, these entrances. I think the garage doors themselves are replacements, but the openings are there. Um, and we will talk about the fact these windows are gone because that's important. Um, this is a 1947 image that lets you see up close those uh, showroom windows. And then this is a photograph from 1988 showing the main, the main building. City Motor was established in downtown Salis Salisbury in 1940 by a group of four men. But during World War II, most of Ford's production was focused, focused on the Army's needs. But as soon as the war was over, the company returned to marketing its cars to civilians. City Motor's founders recruited two Salisbury War veterans returning home in 1946 and uh, got them to work at City Motor. One of them was the son of the one of the original owners, and that son was sent to Ford's first merchandising school in 1947. He was one of only 33 men across the country selected to participate in this class. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the company hired local architect John Hartledge to build a new showroom and service facility to match the company's new modern sales methods that included things like big reveals and showrooms that look different than other traditional downtown commercial buildings. With sky-high post-war demand, the company maintained a wait list for cars. Construction of a new VA hospital in Salisbury in 1953 further boosted business. The building operated as a Ford dealership until the late 1980s when Ford began requiring dealerships to be located outside of cities closer to interstates and to build new dealership buildings in standardized designs. City Motor is a complex of buildings with the showroom at the front and an original, an, an, an original service wing connected to the back of the showroom. Behind that is a small auto parts storage building and a Quonset hut, both added very soon after the original construction as pictured in this 1950 Sanborn map. So here's the main building with the showroom a small auto parts storage building, and then um, auto repair, which was a um, Quonset hut. So I've highlighted those first buildings here in blue. Then in 1954, they added another service building. And then in 55, a small office. This is a rough outline of where the boundary um, would most likely go. It would be a fo following the original lot line shown on the 1950 Sanborn map, which is a smaller area than the land currently associated with the complex. So we're gonna go on a little tour around the building uh, as it stands today. You can see original casement windows, these original pedestrian entrances, 
Um, and you'll, you'll see lots of original features. The main thing is that these big showroom windows are, of course, uh, missing. So moving around the side. And then looking at the whole, kind of the whole main building. The service wing at the back really has a kind of a Detroit manufacturing um, mm -hmm. feel to me. So this is the back sort of where the original service building and this car parts, auto parts storage building, and then you can see the Quonset hut sticking out back there. This is the auto parts storage building, very utilitarian, but um, not a lot of alterations. This is the back of that building and still the back of that building, just moving down along the, <clears throat> the buildings are lined up in a, in a line. This is the Quonset, the back of the Quonset hut. This is the side of the 1954 service building. And then this is kind of the whole the composite of that. So the, the main building, auto parts storage, Quonset hut, and then 54 service building. So we're moving around the end or the back and then back up the opposite side. This is the 54 store um, service building, Quonset hut, more Quonset hut, the auto parts uh, storage building, the back end of the main building, another view of the back end of the main building, the opposite side of the main building of that original service wing, and then back to the front and a look at some of the details. Um, you can see that window has been replaced, but that's kind of a historic replacement, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and then a detail of these uh, pedestrian en entrances. There's two of these that are identical. And then going inside, um, original finishes uh, on the inside include plaster walls, um, terrazzo flooring, even a, the little bell to announce your entrance. Mm -hmm. um, this is looking into the showroom. Then the showroom itself. So the other problem with the showroom is the drop ceiling. They, it used to be a full height uh, space in there, but they inserted a mezzanine level. So this is the showroom. This is in the service wing looking back toward the showroom. One of the interior staircases. A, really aside from the showroom, there's a lot of original stuff in here. This is upstairs in that mezzanine above the showroom. So that's, that's that weird upstairs garage door you can see outside. Um, underneath the plywood upstairs are a more original plaster, um, except where the windows were and are not currently. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the original service area looking back toward the showroom up here. Um, it's got a lot of stuff in it, but it's all um, the original space was just a wide open uh, service area. Inside the Quonset hut. Again, uh, used as storage now, but originally wide open and still open like it was. And this is the 1955, 54-55 service um, building, the second one. And then this really great uh, aerial shot of the whole complex. So the front, this is from the 50s, auto storage, Quonset hut, and the second service building. City Motor retains a very high degree of architectural integrity. However, the showroom's windows have been replaced with solid walls and the showroom's height has been truncated with the addition of a mezzanine. The entire complex retains great integrity, but the showroom is one of the key functions of the site and a highlight of its architectural design. Staff does not think City Motor would be a viable National Register candidate with the existing changes to the showroom in place. However, staff does recommend that the site be added to the study list under criteria A and C for its associations with commerce and architecture, with the caveat that National Register listing before reopening the windows and showroom height is extremely unlikely. If the committee agrees, the applicant would like guidance on how much work would be needed to be done before pursuing a nomination. Is it sufficient to open up the window openings or does the glass need to be fully installed? 
Is it enough to remove the interior floor or should the interior be truly finished? And I should add the application does include comparison information about other dealerships in Salisbury from the mid-century. And they are either much simpler traditional downtown commercial buildings uh, or they've been torn down. All right, those are my three and I'm happy to take questions and I'm eager to hear what y'all think about City uh, Motor. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, questions, comments? I have two questions uh, uh, oh, and, and one uh, rather generic. Uh, who, are, uh, who owns the Woodland Manufacturing Company and also the uh, City Motor Company? City, I'm not sure who owns City Motor Company. Um, right off the top of my head. Let me look through the application. Okay, so the, the City Motor is owned by a group of siblings who, it looks like they might be descendants of the original owners when it was mm -hmm. ship. I'm not entirely sure of that, but I think that's who they are. And then Woodlawn is owned uh, by an individual, um, Roger Lovett is his name. Okay. Okay. Now, my 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 last question, uh, which is uh, kind of generic, uh, what is the uh, what's the percentage uh, of, uh, of 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 items or uh, 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 listings on the study list that make it to the nomination list? Mm. Um, Jen might be able to help us with that. If um, I, I don't know that we have a good um, number on that. We have a lot of things that get at the end of a um, at the end of a countywide or municipal survey. We often do sort of a batch of study list uh, resources that the consultant thinks are good candidates, but that the owners may not have any interest in ever following through on. Mm -hmm. So things that get study listed are a mix of things like um, city motor, where it's it's likely that um, if it gets a thumbs up, the owner will follow through. And also a mix of things that come out of survey projects that no one, that may never have any further interest. I don't, Jen, do you have any other comments on that? Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. Um, not everything that's added to the study list um, does end up being pursued for listing, but uh, I mean, if you were just gonna rough estimate based on the last several years of rounds, maybe like 75% are coming back to us um, as nominations. A lot of, we've gotten a lot of owner interested and incentive interested folks okay. who are like eager to follow up. And in that way, recently it's been um, a lot of close follow-up paralleling the study list. I think that's just a rough, that's a rough okay. estimate though. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Ramona, you're you're muted. Dr. Gennard, if I could add, I guess I'm getting a little bit more institutional knowledge these days. This will be year 10 for me. Um, I think Jen's exactly right. The, the sort of common denominator I've observed is an advocate wanting the property. They, they, they seek the study list themselves and move it forward, or there's a local government or a local nonprofit that's interested in the properties. But I think our exercise of coming in after a, a survey is done is also helpful because it, it gives um, some more attention to some properties and might gather some advocates in as well. But I think that's an excellent question, sir. Okay, thanks. I wanted to add that if the committee is interested in more concrete numbers relative to Dr. Denard's question, that's probably something that we could pull together fairly easily using our survey database between now and the next meeting. That'd be great. Please do. Thanks. Yep. And Annie, um, Annie McDonald just uh, pointed out to me that, that the other thing that it's useful for is 
environmental review, you know, it's another, it's an extra pin on the map to highlight something that uh, needs attention in the environmental review process. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, thoughts about the City Motor Company? I just wanted to say I share um, Sarah's observation and concern about the windows. It is disappointing not to see it with the windows because it does have, it's kind of funky and that mezzanine kind of space is, is I don't, it's odd. Yeah, I'd like to agree. Staff, you know, it's got to be back to the showroom configuration. I mean, that's a pretty character defining feature of the building to have that showroom space with the large windows and, you know, full height room, because that obviously was a critical component that it's been designed that way. So you would want to see the, the full windows back in and then if they, let's say they put the windows back in and took out the mezzanine floor, but maybe didn't finish things inside yet. Like sort of how early in a restoration would you feel comfortable moving forward with a National Register nomination? I mean, as long as the exterior has a general appearance, I think you know, we should have full height windows back. And I wish they'd done on the inside, you know, if we left. I mean, they could probably work something out if they wanted to maintain a mezzanine. But I think from the outside, it should appear like it's one giant space with windows. I've got a question for Sarah and Jen about this. It's not quite the same, but it is kind of the same. Um, we oftentimes have seen mills that have had blocked up windows for a variety of reasons. I expect plate glass at that size is pretty expensive. And at some point, something happened and it wasn't fully replaced. Um, maybe we, is there some parallel with mills where we have you know, this large amount of fenestration and something has happened, but, you know, is, is the opening being open without the glass sufficient? Jen, can you comment on that? Is that, is that a close enough parallel, I think, to help the committee a little bit or, or not? I think, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's sort of a matter of like a commercial room or a commercial building where display is the intention. Um, the passerby seeing the full height um, display space is um, the goal and um, the windows and the mill, I guess, were more to accommodate the folks inside rather than draw the, the person going by outside. Um, one thing that could be done as far as um, how far to take it. And if they're thinking about tax credits, maybe the part one could bear that out. Um, let them know if it's, you know, time for the NR. Um, just a, just a- yeah, Ra Ramona, this is Scott. From, I think it seems like in years past, we've wanted to, for those mill complexes to at least see some of the windows go in so we know what they're going to look like. So we know that they're on the right mm -hmm. track for putting in the right windows. I think this would be the sort of the same mm -hmm. direction for this building because you can't just stick a window in. It needs to no, be that's a correct. window. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot that's uh, disguised there because of the way it's been changed. I think it's hopeful that it seems like the owners are interested though in moving mm -hmm. forward with this. And I think, in my opinion, um, putting it on the study list is a good faith effort towards mm -hmm. that effort, and especially with guidance about how far they do need to take it. Mm -hmm. But those windows are certainly the character defining element of that uh, building and something needs to be done. I agree. If I could offer something from the designer developer perspective, this is one of the trickiest issues with a lot of these buildings, because a lot of times we're talking about putting in window systems that are far, far more costly than they would mm -hmm. be otherwise able to afford. So um, it's a challenge because we're kind of at loggerheads with what we're responsible for and what the developers in their best faith efforts are endeavoring to do. So trying to find the middle ground where um, we can do enough 
that we feel comfortable, but not burdening them. Because a lot of times if they commit to putting in these window systems, the project is financially insolvent without the tax credits. It's that simple. So. Yeah, I think it would be, um, I absolutely support staff's recommendations at this point. Um, I think it would be arguable if they don't do anything. I think that they, whether or not it would get through or not, um, but I think, you know, thinking about, I was also thinking about mills and other things that we have um, voted through in recent years that had, you know, partial obstruction, mm -hmm. um, but being able to see where the fenestration pattern was um, is important. I think there are probably several options um, that, that could work and presumably, you know, they would be able to consult with SHPO staff you know, throughout the, the process and, and tax credit staff as well. So um, I think we're all in agreement, like something needs to give, but precisely what and what it would take um, to, to, for a complete um, voting it, but to recommend listing. I, I think there's some options there um, for sure. May I ask the committee a different question to help me as well? If the windows in the showroom were intact as they were, would there be a question as to your vote, mm -hmm. given the balance of the rest of the building? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, fortunately, they do have great documentary photographs of what it looked like. So they should be able to pull a design that's pretty close. Maybe it's not a replica, but pretty close to what was there. Um, it's not like they're just trying to scratch your head and guess what was. Yeah, they do. They do have good photographs, and um, yeah. So I think I think you've given us some some uh, enough that we can work up work up some guidance for them, some feedback. So thank you. Yeah, that was going to be my question, Sarah. Was did we, as a committee, provide enough to? All right, great. Yeah. Uh, is there a motion to approve staff recommendations for these three properties for the study list? So moved. David. Thank you, D David Burks. Now I'm like looking on my screen here. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All right. Thank you, Fred. Um, so we will go through and do our roll call vote. Uh, Mary Lynn Bryan. Yes. Thank you. I vote yes. Alicia McGill. Uh, David Denard. Yes. Thank you. Valerie Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Terry Russ. Yes. Kristen Baldwin Dethridge. Yes. And is that, that's all of us. Yes. Oh, Matt. Matt Jorgensen. Jor Matt Jorgensen. Yes. I was like, you're all the way at the bottom there. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, so I am, I, I'm anticipating, um, that the last two presentations, well, we have a district presentation. Audrey, about how long will your presentation take? I think it's about like six to seven minutes. Okay. Um, and then Annie, Annie, are you there? I am here. Uh, mine is short. Mine might be five minutes long. Okay. Then if everyone is, is okay with that, then I think we'll just move forward with the mm -hmm. last two presentations. Fred, I know that you'll have to step out. So probably this is a good time for you to, to just step out and, and thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> and yeah, then we will just move straight into our last two presentations. Bye, Fred. <laughs> All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, all right. Uh, so today I'm presenting- Yes. <laughs> today I'm presenting a potential downtown historic district in Taylorsville, North Carolina. Uh, so Taylorsville is the county seat uh, located in central Alexander County, both of which were established in 1847. Taylorsville was laid out this same year with a central courthouse. In the 1880s, the introduction of the railroad improved access to Taylorsville and the population doubled by 1900. During these early years, downtown commercial buildings were largely frame, gable fronted and one to two stories. 
As industry was established and grew, Taylorsville began to see some prosperity as the county's government, commerce, and industrial center. This is reflected in the architectural growth in the downtown area during the 1920s. We begin to see typical early 20th century commercial architecture of one to two story brick buildings with flat roofs and brick ornamentation. However, the depression of the 1930s stopped virtually all building in the town, which did not resume until after World War II. Beginning in the 1960s, establishment of new industry, namely the furniture industry, began to provide some recovery to the economic growth of the town. Uh, Taylorsville has only been surveyed once. This occurred in 1986 to 87 by Vicki Mason during a two county reconnaissance survey where little documentation was recorded in downtown Taylorsville. The survey I'm currently conducting is part of a citywide municipal survey prompted by interest from a newly, for, a newly formed preservation commission in the county. So far, I've surveyed 66 buildings in the downtown area seen here in the red outline. And the proposed district consists of 33 primary buildings, three of which were previously surveyed, seen here in the purple. After today's NRAC meeting, I'll continue my survey and I'll present the rest of my results from Taylorsville at a future meeting. So here's a 1924 Sandbach, Sanborn map, which shows the early configuration of the downtown with notable buildings, including the courthouse here, the Methodist church here, the county jail, and the Hotel Campbell here. This is a mid-1950s aerial, which shows the downtown district. Um, and I'll note that the western boundary of the district runs along here around First Street. And that's because this block back here uh, was largely demolished during the mid-2010s. Uh, this is a 1987 aerial, which shows some of the later changes in the district, including the new 1970 courthouse, some new development behind the Methodist Church, and the removal of a building beside the county jail. And again, here's a recent aerial of what the district looks like today. So next, I'm just gonna quickly walk you through some photographs of the district starting at the west end. So first is the county courthouse. Um, so the first uh, burnt in 1967 and a new br brutalist courthouse was built, finished in 1970. Its brutalist design extends into the landscape with interesting features such as the lampposts and large planters seen in this photograph. Um, this is the block directly north of the courthouse during the 1920s. And this three storefront section here received a facade update in the 1930s, becoming the Smithies department store. Uh, this building maintains its diamond brick ornamentation, the window rhythm along the upper story, recessed entryways and st a structural glass facade. Here's the same uh, block from the 1986 survey and what the block look, looks like today. So in this photo, you can see the consistent brick ornamentation and upper story window configuration, leaving the historic block very discernible from what's extant today. Moving east, we have the Masonic building here, which was built in 1909, making it the earliest documented remaining building in the downtown area and this early 1970s building here. Uh, the Masonic building retains its brick ornamentation, the window pattern, a brick arch entryway here, and a recessed corner entry that has a tile floor. Next is the Taylorsville Times, which has significant integrity problems with an updated circa 2000 facade. Um, this is the first Methodist church. Uh, it displays a prominent tower and pointed arch stained glass windows. It appears to have undergone a renovation in the mid to late 1950s, including an enlarged front entry. And then in the early 1990s, a large rear addition was added here. North of this block is another grouping of attached brick commercial buildings. We do see some storefront renovations here and some bricked in windows. However, in these shots, it's easy to see how the historic block is still discernible within the current block. Uh, window openings are recognizable even where they are bricked in and brick ornamentation along the cornice remains. Uh, continuing to move east, this pattern remains, remains consistent. Here we have a recessed panel and recessed entryways at the storefront. This building has the historic window openings and they're kind of hard to see, but there's some of that diamond brick ornamentation along the cornice as well. Uh, the Hotel Campbell was study listed in 2020. The brick ornamentation remains as well as historic window openings and it appears the historic transom lights may remain under the awnings as well. Uh, to the south of this block, we see some of the only completely new construction in the district with this circa 1990 three storefront section here, which replaced three storefronts uh, seen down here in the 1987 aerial. Um, and just behind sits the 1913 County Jail, which was study listed in 1988. And this jail exhibits great exterior integrity with original windows, the dormer, um, and no additions after this 1930s edition here. 
Uh, lastly, at the far east end of the proposed districts, it's a circa 1935 gas station, which maintains its character and its window and door openings, the gable and chim chimneys and steeply pitched roof. Uh, so this is a sample map of potentially contributing and non-contributing properties. Contributing properties are in yellow, uh, potentially non-contributing properties due to integrity are in pink and due to age and orange. Uh, so the likely period of significance for the district would be from 1909 when the earliest remaining building, the Masonic Building, was constructed, to 1971 when Taylorsville began seeing a boost in its economy and after the completion of the new courthouse. Uh, to determine if historic buildings were contributing, I tried to, to best determine how many changes had been made to the original building and when those changes occurred. So some examples of non-contributing buildings would include these. So this one has a circa 1980 facade on it. This one has replaced and enlarged window openings, a replacement door, and these new awnings. Um, this one's obviously been altered a lot with the stone facade on the front, the covered cornice, and then this is a circa 1980s gas station. Um, so these are some examples of what I put as contributing. Um, these retain their character in their historic exterior materials, window patterns and openings, uh, ornamentation like the projecting brick courses on the hotel and the recessed panels on the pawn shop building, the recessed entryways on the Smithies building, and then the landscape features of the courthouse grounds. Uh, the downtown Taylorsville Historic District appears to be eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places under Criteria A for significance in the area of commerce and potentially under Criteria C for architecture. Staff recommends placing the district on the National Register study list, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Audrey. Are there any questions? No real questions, but I'm not generally a fan of brutalist architecture, but those light poles are pretty awesome and they work so well um, with the whole structure. Any other questions or comments? Not a question, but I just want to say that uh, I had Audrey as an undergrad way back <laughs> and uh, just really excited and uh, proud to see her rocking it here today. So. Yeah. Congrats to both of you. We've been delighted to have Audrey here. She is really amazing, as you saw from her presentation. And also just to kind of, this is something y'all already know, but to step back to Zebulon, the way she illustrated her wide net of survey work and then the resulting smaller district did a really nice job of illustrating that, that process. Thanks. All right, um, well, I think we'll move to Annie's presentation and then vote on both of the presentations um, for the uh, Western area. Um, so, yeah. I will try to be as fast as possible because I understand I am, I, I lie between y'all and the rest of your day because I think this is the last one. I feel um, like Annie, you're often at, at the at the end, and and so you don't need to apologize that <laughs> you're, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, the second and final study list candidate for the Western Region is the Blue Ridge Tourist Court and Motel. Shown here, circa 1951, shortly after its construction. And here, circa 1954, following construction of the upper motel building shown here. The property is in central Watauga County, just east of the county seat of Boone, in a part of town where there is no prior survey coverage. At the time it was built, the property was located in a community known as Perkinsville, about a mile east of the Boone town limits. Mm. This area was later mm. annexed into the corporate limits of the town. The buildings of the Blue Ridge Tourist Court and Motel lie between Old East Main Street to the north and Cecil Miller Road to the south. The collection of buildings that comprise the Blue Ridge Tourist Court and Motel are spread across three tax parcels that were historically one property that was later subdivided. For the purpose of study list designation, it must be noted that the north and south boundaries should extend beyond the tax parcel lines to the edge of pavement 
along Old East Main Street and Cecil Miller Road to fully capture the full extent of the eligible property. Six buildings comprise the tourist court and motel. Erected circa 1948, this modest dwelling is the oldest building associated with the complex and predates the tourist court. In May 1949, the Carolina Land Auction Company announced the auction of Tom Baumgartner's new brick seven room home on one acre of land. Baumgartner desperately needed to sell the property to pay off a substantial fine from a criminal conviction for running an illegal liquor operation. In September 1949, Tom and Pamsey Bumgardner conveyed the parcel to Estelle G. Wagner. While Wagner was a recent transplant to the area, his wife Lucille was a Watauga County native. Having newly arrived in Boone and eagerly making social connections in the community, Wagner embarked on a new career path. In the early 1950s, local Chamber of Commerce discussions centered on bringing to Boone a Kermit Hunter production like Unto These Hills, which had just opened that summer at Cherokee, North Carolina. Chamber members expressed frustrations, though, that Boone lacked sufficient accommodations to support that level of tourism. This need prompted Wagner uh, to build the motel. This is the front of that house. Um, so he built the seven room tourist court building in 1950 and added the four room, two unit annex um, and the garage apartment shown here in 1951. The latter of the two of which were designed to accommodate long-term stays by virtue of their kitchen facilities. The upper motel building was added circa 1953. Shown here circa 1960, it was erected in response to growing demand for tourist lodging in and around Boone in the mid 1950s. By this point, um, un, uh, the Horn in the West drama had been uh, built and was well established. The first of these kinds of properties in Boone was probably Earl D. Cook's Black Bear Tourist Court, a large home surrounded by small disconnected cabins located just east of the town. Opened in 1946, any remaining vestige of those buildings was lost with the widening of US 421. Another tourist court spurred by demands from the local junior league was the Mountain Motel opened um, in August of 1948. It expanded in size as demand increased, but was demolished for a McDonald's a couple decades ago. By late 1951, the Hamby Tourist Court was in operation just east of downtown Boone as a collection of cabins around a dwelling. While one of the smaller buildings of that operation still survives as an unrecognizable student apartment house, the Hamby Tourist Court appears to have ceased operations by the mid 1960s and the main house and other cabins no longer stand. By 1956, Boone advertised considerably more lodging opportunities. The Blue Ridge Tourist Court and Motel is believed to be the last of the early tourist courts and motels of the late 1940s and early 1950s to survive in the town. All others have met with partial or complete demolition. Also, by the time of this photo, circa 1960, we see that the porch on the dwelling had been enclosed. That is a noteworthy um, observation. Today, the buildings of the Blue Ridge Tourist Court are in disrepair, but the complex retains a remarkably high degree of integrity for a mid-century motel in Western North Carolina. This small, vaguely modernist influenced grand building was erected in 1950 and served as the office. The plate glass windows remain intact beneath the plywood. The interior is finished with knotty pine and features a granite fireplace with a polished granite mantle. In the foreground here was the site of a swimming pool, which was added in the 1960s and which is shown here in this 1983 survey of the property. The pool was later filled in, but this change does not jeopardize the historic character of the complex or diminish its integrity. The L-shaped tourist court building is mostly unaltered with the modest exception of the addition of this porch structure on the west end. This end room is the only one finished with knotty pine, which is a higher level of finish than the rest of the rooms in the building. 
The annex building is similarly finished on the interior. A minor modification was made early on to the garage apartment when a doorway next to the chimney in the upper left photo was blocked. Otherwise, the building is remarkably intact. The motel unit is also substantially intact to the 1950s and retains original windows under the plywood. While some of the interior rooms have been painted, others retain their original unpainted knotty pine finish. The Blue Ridge Tourist Court and Motel is significant and appears to be National Register eligible at the local level under Criterion A in the area of entertainment and recreation for its association with mid-century tourism and roadside lodging in Boone and Watauga County. The anticipated period of significance is 1950 to 1970, representing the core period of the property's use as a true roadside motel. It is also significant at the local level under criterion B for its association with Estelle G. Wagner, a mid-century developer and real estate magnate who is believed to have been Boone's first real estate broker and who played a major role in the development of Boone's mid-century tourism trade. Wagner built the tourist court and motel operation beginning in 1950 and held the property until its sale in 1956. Staff recommends placing the property on the National Register study list. And that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you, Annie. Any questions for Annie? No, all right. Is there a motion to approve the last two presentations? I move that we approve the two presentations and staff, accept staff recommendations. Thank you. I would, I would love to second that. All right, thank you. <laughs> Let's go through our final vote of the day. Um, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Great, thank you. I vote yes. Dr. Denard. You're muted. <laughs> it looked like a yes. Uh, 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 yes, yes, thank I you. vote yes. All right, Mr. Bergstone. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen. Yes. Okay, I think that's everybody. So um, great. Um, any last minute business or anything else to attend to? Um, a, a round of applause for everybody for sticking through it, but also um, a, another thank you for your service to uh, Terry Russ, Kristen Baldwin, Deathridge, and Scott Power. I think you're still on the, the call here too. Um, thank you to everybody. We may, we, we may see you all back somehow. Yeah. But <laughs> mm -hmm. I just want to thank everyone, staff and committee members. Thank you for your stamina and your strong engagement and uh, being so conscientious in what you're doing. Thank you very much. I'm very appreciative. And I'm glad to see you. I hope to see you in person next time. Yeah, me too. Yeah, just want to say mark your calendars for Thursday, October 14th and stand by. Maybe we can maybe we can see your faces in person. That would be great. Thanks. Order some food. Um, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. So moved. <laughs> All right. And we don't need to vote on that, right? We <laughs> all in favor, aye. Uh, uh, aye. All right. Aye. Um, it, it was great seeing everybody. You all take care and have a lovely summer. And um, yeah, we'll see you all, uh, almost all of you in October. That's right. Thank you very much. Bye, take care. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good job, everybody. Everybody.